Hi guys. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel. My name is Aaron, and today we're playing more Disco Elysium. And I'd like to address the last episode right now. So I think it's become like a running gag on the series where I say the last episode was kind of a mess and it's not always justified because it really just means I didn't stick to the main plot and I just went off and did my own thing. But last episode was actually a mess. <laughs> it was a hot mess. I, I was not feeling so good. I think you guys could tell. I had to pause. I literally paused like 10 minutes into the episode and I had to go lay down and just cry because <clears throat> my stomach hurts so bad. Be thankful if you're not a woman. <laughs> just gotta say that. I just, I have so much regret for the last episode. I almost wish I didn't record at all and I just saved it because my reactions in the last part were not great because I was in so much pain and I, I should have just stopped it there and just recorded a different day, but I did not. I pushed through and here we are. As much as I regret, I did have a lot of fun last episode. I have a lot of fun every time I record this game, but um, <laughs> I like, I was so salty the whole time and I even got angry at Kim, which is rare, um, but I think I was just very emotional. I got angry because he was kind of like complaining a lot and I mean, understandable because we were doing a lot of side stuff that didn't per pertain to the main reason that they're both there. In the last episode, we helped out Lena and her husband Morel. We checked all of his phasmid traps because um, we he was trying to capture this mythical phasmid creature. The last trap that we checked, it seemed like maybe the phasmid had been there and ate all the locusts, but that was not the case. It was actually Kuno who broke into the trap and stole all the locusts and made a little like locust city in his shack. It was kind of cute. It seemed like Morel and Lena were pretty disappointed that it wasn't actually a phasmid. So again, we agreed to help them out and I think reset the traps is what we're doing. Either way, I like the side quest. I'm probably gonna continue it in this episode and see where it goes because it's just pretty fun. Someone also pointed out that they wanted me to buy the board game in the, um, the bookstore because they said it was like a cute interaction with Kim. I don't know. So I'm gonna do that because that sounds like a lot of fun. Also, I, I don't remember what else we did. The other thing we did in the last episode was finally meet up with the guy on the balcony. We still don't know his name, but when we went up there, he hardcore flirted with Harry and that completely went over my head when I first played it. I don't know why. I think I realized it towards the end. I don't know, he was very different. He was very mellowed out and he didn't seem bothered by talking to you know to us because i don't i don't know why because when we first met him he was really like hesitant to even speak with us at all so this was a huge shift in his personality and it was very strange it's clear that he was hitting on harry hardcore though so that was really funny and kim was barely keeping it together so <laughs> there's that i hope we get to meet up with him soon because i think he has a lot more answers than he's letting on the other part was we went inside and we spoke to his Sunday friend. I feel like I screwed up that whole interaction so bad. I think there was a lot more that that guy could have told us and I just totally missed out. I don't know what I did wrong. I don't know what I did wrong. I feel like there's something that I missed out on. I didn't exhaust his dialogue enough or something because we didn't really learn anything from him and I was really hoping we would. He basically kind of confirmed everything that we already knew as far as like it was the Hardy Boys. I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's obvious that they did it. It's not obvious why or how they did it to me. He didn't see the man get shot. Um, he only saw them like hanging the body and that there were eight men around. Um, so that confirms the whole, there were eight people there, but there's only seven Hardy Boys. So who's the eighth Hardy Boy? We don't know. I really hope there's nothing I missed that was too important talking to that guy. I hope we can talk to him again. I don't know. Uh, I just really hope I didn't miss anything. Yeah, I'm hoping that I can continue the main story a little bit. I'm gonna do a bunch of side stuff, I'm sure. I might even help Andre and his um, his pals <laughs> uh, out with that whole remodeling the church into a, a rave scene for the local youth. I might do that one. I don't know, anything that I want because I'm feeling so much better, thank God. And uh, I'm ready to get into this game again. So let's not waste more time and let's get back into this game and see what happens next. Okay, we're back. Oh my god, it's so much different recording a game when you're not in severe amounts of pain. Imagine that. 
What are these doing in fish? What? What are these doing in fish? Uh, okay, I got boots. <laughs> Great start to the episode. Um, okay. Fran Congerian Calvary boots? Is that how you say that? Good old calf length cavalry boots. Mount that horse and ride into the night. The heel comes in handy too. It definitely makes you some good five centimeters tall. Taller. <laughs> I'm only five centimeters tall. But it could be. But it could. Okay. <laughs> wow. Could it be that it's also making you sharper, more perceptive to your surroundings now that you've gained a new perspective? I kind of like those actually. Um, not with this outfit specifically, but let's put on my crocodile shoes. Hello, person I don't think we've met before. Hi, officer. Oh. She's pretty. A woman in a raincoat stands on the quay, considering an overturned boat. A sword and a scabbard hangs from her hip. Okay. Anything I can help you with? That depends. Where are we exactly? A fishing village on the seashore. This place doesn't really have a name. It's sometimes called Illicibla. She looks around. Why? The sign on the street leading here is illegible. Has been since they built this place. The wind rattles her earrings. Does she have, like, fishing lures as earrings? That's pretty cool. I have questions. First is, what's your name? The name is Lillian. People call me Net Picker. I think I have time for questions. And that was actually the second one. She gestures towards the fishnets. Indeed. You're always confused <laughs> as to your whereabouts. Oh, yeah. Ask her about the cool sword. Helps to break the ice. Oh. Oh, this is a person I need a signature from? Um, I'm looking for someone. Maybe you can help. I was asked to get your signature. What do you do around here? Nice sword. Is that your boat? Nice sword. Point at the saber on her hip. Does it come with a story? Unfortunately, the factory sold this one with a three-year warranty instead of story. <laughs> it's to intimidate folks, mostly. She smiles at her own joke. Hold on, do you know how to use it? It is imposing. Nod. Isn't that what guns are for? Do you know how to use it? Not really. I know some basic moves, and I know it sure as hell beats a knife when you're in a tough spot. I guess so. She glances at the blade. I mean, it wouldn't help to actually learn. <laughs> uh, it is imposing. It's a regular mass-produced sword, like a shovel or an axe. Nothing fancy. Just for intimidation. I, I really like her. Is she... She kind of looks like that girl we saw in uh, that house that we took the bird from. She kind of looks like her. Why do you need intimidation tactics? From time to time, people need a lesson in respect. That's just the way it is. Back in the day, I caught the eyes of many men. <laughs> and believe me, men need a lesson in manners from time to time. She adds, tittering. Uh, yes, agreed. <laughs> Can I borrow that sword? Why don't more women arm themselves if it's so effective? What makes you think we haven't? <laughs> the truth is that almost everyone in this life is scared and tired and stupid and too dull for that. She smiles. That goes for men too. But they put on an act for us. Pretend like everything's good and living in shit doesn't bother them. Like anyone falls for that. That does not go for real men. It does not go for you. Show her. Show her the wonder. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Coach means the expression. <laughs> Behold. <laughs> Behold. Point to the expression on your face. I'm a proper man, believe me. True, most people I've met are scared. I'm not gonna try the expression, sorry. I. No one wants to talk about how frightened they are. But only frightened people are really dangerous. And plenty of them are dangerous. I'm not gonna ask to borrow her sword, because I feel like she needs it more than me. Where are all the men now? Some went to patch their wounds, their lesson learned. Others were more thick-headed. And one of them... I ended up marrying. She looks down. Wait, why, if they're thick-headed? Where's your husband now? Sometimes it's really hard for women to find work and they need a man who has a job. 
and can bring in that income even if they don't necessarily love them. That's just my assumption. <laughs> but that's how it was back in the day, I mean. Wait, why, if they're thick-headed? Guess I enjoyed the way he bled. Her expression doesn't change. It's hard to say if it's a joke. Uh... <laughs> Then why the melancholy? Where's your husband now? Gone. Gone where? Gone? Coward! I would never leave anyone. He disappeared? Sounds like a missing, missing person's case. Gone where? To the waves. The sea took him. It was a long time ago. Damn. I'm sorry. That's bad. What happened? Oh. Say no more. Wait for her to continue. He died? Was he murdered? No. Probably a boating accident. Um. Oh. He didn't respect the sea. Went out there, drunk like a skunk, and sure enough, one day, the boat was found floating empty. The bloated corpse turned up two weeks later. Now, before you tell me how sorry you are for my loss, know that it was four years ago, and I've moved on. There's only so much mourning you can do for a drunk with sinewy muscles. Yeah, death is nothing. I shit on death. <laughs> you should have thrown yourself in the ways after him. Uh, no. Time really is the best cure for sorrow, isn't it? It's healthy to let go and move on. Gotta keep the wheels spinning. Us working folk don't have the luxury to be bed sick with melancholy. I buried him, mourned for an appropriate amount of time, and went on. She crosses her arms. Life didn't really change that much for me and the kids. She glances at the village where the two little kids are playing with what? Oh yeah, she is the mom! It looks like rocks, because the boys are the girl's brother, I think. This is neither a touchy nor a very interesting topic for her. Hmm. She looks like she's ready to go on a date with another, better, drunk. <laughs> Ask her. Both of you could need some action. Do it! Hit on the widow! It's the right thing to do! No, no, no. Kim's presence makes it awkward. Oh, no. I'm not doing that. Oh, God. No, 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 no. I'm looking for someone. Maybe you can help. I don't know who I'm looking for, so I don't know why I'd ask that. Is that your boat? Point at the overturned boat. Sure is. The sun, I call her. Coated with a fresh layer of tar just yesterday. It'll take some time for it to dry. Assuming the sunny days continue. <laughs> She's being sarcastic. Um, say nothing. She looks at the boat, dripping with slush, and nods proudly. Uh, what do you do around here? Like I said, fish mostly. Sail the waves, take care of the kids, pick nets. Right now I'm tarring a little skiff. Uh, what else? I sell the fish to people in the Delta to serve at their fancy restaurants. Authentic insul Indian cuisine. Hmm. Is that enough to make a living? Sometimes I also walk to the beach to see what the sea has given up. The sea is full of surprises. Keep it professional, man. Don't make it sound like you're <laughs> yes. hitting on her. This is what That's is what called a conversation. You don't have to be guarded right now. <laughs> Interesting. What have you found? I never thought the sea brought in anything particularly interesting. Walking on the beach sounds quite romantic. Alright, I think I get it. Let me ask you something else. Uh, what have you found? Wood. Pieces of glass. Every once in a while we see dead bodies. Human, oh. <laughs> animal, fish, other odd sea creatures. A mine washed ashore once. My husband... <laughs> okay, that's horrible. <laughs> Bottled, drugs also. Lost cargo in general. Most of the time, it's just wood and glass. All right. Major choice moment. You only get to ask <laughs> one thing. It would be weird to say them all. Choose wisely. I need to know about those human bodies. A mine? The RCM could use a mine. Where is it? Drugs? I need info on this. Major narc. Point to yourself. This place looks bad. Why don't you leave? Um... Uh... Um... <laughs> I need to know about the human bodies. Well, you're barking under the wrong tree then, officer. I have no interest in floaters. 
Seen enough of them in my life already. Very unattractive bunch. Yeah, maybe steer clear of the things reminding her of the floater she used to be married to. Just Sorry. Some. Sorry. <laughs> that was a bad option. Um, I was asked to get your signature. Point, hand her Everett's envelope. Are you? Hmm. This says by signing, I agree to living with construction noise. What exactly is the union building? Her eyes dart back and forth on the page. Everett's planning to turn some of the village into a youth center. What a nice idea. Wouldn't have thought, but... Her voice trails off. She sounds incredulous about the niceness of the idea. Yeah. Thought what exactly? That Evrar and the Union have nice plans for anything. I thought they only cared about themselves. Well, I guess Union members have children too. She shakes her head. And those members have a vote when electing the head of the local chapter. On second thought, don't sign the papers. Aye, if you say so. Probably better that way. I mean, who likes construction noise? I don't know. I don't know whether I want to go down that path. Because I don't trust Ever at all. So... <laughs> I don't know. I'm looking for someone. Maybe you can help. Let's see. Who are you looking for? I like to ask something else. Well, how can I assist you then, officer? Okay. I don't have anyone I'm looking for, I guess. Alright, great. <laughs> this boat is floating freely in the water, unmoored. Alright, well, she was really interesting. I like talking to her. The plank beneath... The planks creak under... <laughs> beneath her way. I can't freaking speak. God damn it. Okay. Letter leads off to a school of fish swimming in the kelp. All right. So what I'm gonna do is fast travel back to um, the bookstore. It's day four. It's been raining all day. All right. <laughs> Let's buy that uh, board game because I want to see what that's all about. I don't think Kim is willing to play a board game with me right now. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Can we actually play it? <laughs> I have thirty-seven dollars. I think that's enough. A small mountain of colorful board games. Twenty-five. Boxes. There are numerous types of games for all oh ages. My God. A lot of shelf space seems to be taken up by we're our related merchandise. All right, I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> I want to buy the Wirral game. If you say so, but you better stay away from those immoral occult rituals. Okay. Sergey, what board games do you have here? Wonderful board games, sir. The Viticulturist is a classic for sure. Or perhaps you'd like Archipelagos of Insulinda, a very educational game for those interested in geography. Raubritter is a fun game of economic competition that can get quite intense after a while. We have games for the whole family. You can play with your children. Who are you going to play board games with? Do you have <laughs> friends or family? Do I have friends? Look at the lieutenant. Aww. Wow, I have children? A family? Do I have friends? Are you actually friends? Or just colleagues thrown together by circumstance? <laughs> Aww. We're friends? Oh my god, if Kim says we're not friends, it's gonna break my heart. <laughs> uh, look at me. Who'd want to have children with me? I don't feel as, as if I've had any kids. Yes, kids, friends, chicks. I have all those. <laughs> I don't feel as if I've had any kids. Friends are technically like family. She fiddles with her pendant, thinking. For playing with friends, I'd recommend Suzerainity. Oh, it's come a civilization on. building game where you build a civilization, <laughs> then set off to brutally colonize and repress other civilizations. No. It'll cost 12 real. <laughs> I bought the other one first. For playing with friends. Well, all right. Let's wait for that, because I literally have- I'll have 91 cents left. Oh, freaking okay. Oh god. A high pesternal fan- fantastic fantasy? I don't know. Popular? 
It's a board game. A story with something vistas and featuring odd looking humanoid creatures. It's the third edition mega setting supplements module and can't be played without the main game. What do you mean the main game? What? Let's see. Large letters on the front form a title. We're out. The colorful box is illustrated with bucolic vistas. The cover art also features odd looking humanoids. Some short, some taller, some with pointy ears, others with ephemeral wings. Examine the box. Text underneath the title in smaller typeface reads, third edition, mega setting supplements module. The side panel adds, a sword and sorcery adventure board game with new maps and miniatures. Can we even play this one with him? I think I bought the wrong one. And of course it was so expensive. <laughs> Shake the box. Mysterious things rattle inside. What could they be? Dice? Plastic miniatures? A fantastical alternate world full of magic and wonder? None of that witless man from Hyomdal, fascist dross, <laughs> hidden behind faux realistic allegory. Ural is no cliche ridden apologia for colonial violence. Ural is pure imagination. Yes, the Wirral setting is known for its complicated system of political alignments. But if you're not into that, you can just hack your way through dungeons in search of loot. That's what most people do. Look at the back. A blurb on the back reads, Tired of the tedium and toil of modern life? Escape to Wirral. Leave behind Isolas and nations with their petty squabbles. Discard electricity. Magnets and boring technological widgets. I think this is the wrong Succumb one. <laughs> to a world of high pasternal fantastique. Unleash your imagination and create an adventure of endless possibilities. Discover the terrible secret threatening Wirral. Can your band of adventurers save the world? Yes, we're ready to take on this challenge. Exactly. That's the spirit. All you have to do is read an intricate <laughs> rule book, study an assortment of maps, Unfold the illustrated game board and start rolling dice. In no time, you could be romping through grasslands with low-level characters, hunted by Iskala riders, or battling unspeakable monsters in endless dungeons fraught with danger and despair, conjuring up forceful magics to aid your quest. It's basically just D&D. Don't forget heated arguments escalate into physical confrontation <laughs> with your friends. <laughs> and most importantly, Never forget to rage quit if the dice don't go your way. Open the box. You pry open the box. Inside you find a folded up map, a small booklet, a 24 sided die, and a little plastic figurine. Look at the map. A reprint of a crude hand drawn map. The top left corner reads, Lands of Wirral. The map features both small villages and mid sized towns with odd names. In addition to meadows, forests, hills, lakes, and seas, also with odd names. It doesn't seem to correspond with anything you've seen thus far. <laughs> it's not a very helpful map. I, this is definitely not the one with Kim. Um, I guess we'll just finish looking at it. Look at the booklet. A quick guide to the magical races of Wirral. Create your own hero, choosing from any of these completely unique and fantastical backgrounds. It's like that... Um fortress accident game that we found the options are in order of importance the welkin yeah the tweorg the humans the fairy folk and the pygmies put the booklet away you stuff it back inside the box okay i'm gonna a colorful box <laughs> with the title we're out in bold letters i'm gonna put that away because if i ever need to pass time i'll probably just look at that again so i'll save that um, here's the thing. I am gonna have no money left. Um, I guess I could sell the postcards because I don't think you really need them for anything, as far as I know. All right, I'll have 91 cents left. A small left. mountain of colorful board game boxes. Suzeranti game. Wonderful choice, sir. A wholesome family game. Okay. <laughs> All right, Kim, let's go upstairs and play this game. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. Wow, he's just taking his sweet old time. All right. Board game Suzeranti. 
civilization building board game where you get to choose a nation and set off to colonize and exploit other cultures. A star-shaped note on the box proclaims the game now includes a completely new genocide option. Okay. In your hands, you hold a brand new copy of the game, Suzerainty. It's snugly wrapped in a skin of plastic. The cover features a charming illustration depicting a mass of grinning laborers loading goods onto a ship, while a richly dressed administrator oversees their work. Shake the box. The box has a nice heft to it. You hear the rattle nice. of individual wooden tokens and feel their weight shifting back and forth. What treasures wait <laughs> in store for you? Even before you open it, you can tell that this will be a meaty game of grand strategy and complex oh God. <laughs> interactions. All right, remove the plastic wrap. The plastic wrap rips off as easily as a bodice in a tawdry historical romance. Open the box. There's a hiss as the lid slides off. Inside, you find a thick, full-color rulebook and more than a dozen pouches of various wooden components. <sighs> Savor that new board game smell. A mix of wood, paper, and ink, yes. all wrapped in the sweet must of cardboard. I can't want to play. Uh, read the rule book. Welcome to Suzerainty, a game of economic strategy for the whole family. The rule book is sumptuously illustrated and thick as a Guardian novel. Hmm, this history seems problematic, but it is important to teach children basic economic concepts. The colorful illustrations you know. depict cheerful workers picking apricots, hauling marble sculptures out of crumbling temples, and harvesting a strange magenta-leafed plant. Everyone is smiling. Mm -hmm. okay. You begin to suspect there may be a political agenda to this so-called family game. Surprising. Only one way to find out. Keep reading. The instructions are opaque at first and introduce many concepts you're not familiar with. Fortunately, there are many diagrams and examples throughout. <sighs> you soon figure out the basic conceit. Each player represents an administrator for the suzerain of Revachon. Your objective is to increase the suzerain's wealth and renown by accumulating victory points. How do you accumulate victory points? That's where the suzerain's vessels come in. The game features four vassal nations, each one home to an economically important resource. Each turn, the player collects resources from vessels where they've placed workers. They may then rearrange their workers, fulfill contracts for coin and bonuses, or build structures back in Revachon. Okay. As you leaf through the pages, your eye catches on a sidebar labeled Advice for Beginners. Read the advice. Remember, there are many paths to victory in suzerainty, but successful players will find one strategy and commit to it wholeheartedly. Okay, how is the winner determined? The actual scoring system appears infinitely complex, with a series of tables and appendices Jeez. required to compute each player's final victory point total. You skip that part for now. Examine the components. You open up a number of pouches containing wooden tokens. There are also several punch boards with other cardboard components that will need to be punched out before you can play. Uh, punch out the cardboard pieces one by one. Each cardboard token makes a satisfying <laughs> as you pop it out. Soon, a neat pile of cardboard coins and counters has accumulated before you. What? You're not going to offer to let me punch any of them out? Okay, all right, put the components away, sorry. You hold the open game box before you. Hey, Kim, wanna play? The lieutenant looks <laughs> over the rule book before he sees something that makes his eyes go wide. Holy shit, <laughs> the average playing time for this game is one to six hours. What? Okay, it's so weird hearing him swear. Uh, one to six hours, Jesus, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure we can afford to set aside that kind of time for a game. Come on, please. <laughs> this is so worth it, though. Challenging. Convince Kim to let you to play with you. Please. What? No. Does the lieutenant hate fun? Is he the fun police? No. Who died and made you the fun police? <laughs> the lieutenant gives you a sour look. He may or may not hate fun, but either way, 
He does not appreciate your attitude. I'm sorry. Please. <laughs> what is detective work if not an elaborate game? Yes. You need logical inference, attention to detail, the ability to analyze your opponent's motives. See? Come on, it might <laughs> come on. It might help us think of more creative solutions to the case. Hmm. I do feel like my thinking has become somewhat rigid. Maybe a little diversion to keep the mind limber is just what's in order. See? Is this really going to last six hours? See? He's doing the hard work himself. All he needed was a little nudge. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. You've convinced me. <laughs> How do we play? I read the rules already. I'll show you. You explain the basic setup procedures to the lieutenant, who seems to be a quick study. You each take your bag of tokens and counters and unfold the board between you. In the center is the crown of Revachon. Radiating outward are her colorful vessels, each one supplying some raw material desired by the suzerain. Apricots from Safre, archaeological treasures from Il Marat, sugars from the Seminine Islands, and magenta cocaine from Supra Muindi mm. and Sara Maritza. <laughs> There's also a neat little log to keep track of your progress in case you need to put the game away and return to it later. Okay, so we might not do the whole thing right now then. The lieutenant goes first. He draws a contract card and moves several of his workers to the Safray territory of the board and the others to the Seminine Islands. Okay. All right, detective, your turn. You have a few options mm -hmm. available to you. Will you try to fulfill contracts right away or rearrange your workers to maximize production on future turns? Move the workers. Remember what the rule book said. You'll want to choose a strategy early <laughs> Just on do and stay can't. committed to it. Okay. Um, let your workers rest for a while. Oh, uh, maximize production. Let your workers rest for a while. What is the very beginning of the game? Your workers haven't even done any work yet. Okay, make them work a little, but not too much. That's more like it. You produce a handful of archaeological treasures and a smattering of other resources. Meanwhile, the lieutenant spends two of his sugar and one of his apricot tokens yes, to complete gonna win. his contract card. He is rewarded with four coins and a round wooden token that he places in the center of the board. That's a market. It's worth two victory points. <laughs> Glower silently. Hey, why don't I get one of those? Kim, can I do my first turn over? I think I messed up. Come on, don't be a spoiled sport. Uh, pout silently. The lieutenant returns your baleful look with a satisfied grin. <laughs> you little shit. Come on, is that your game face? You're practically broadcasting your position to the lieutenant with that expression. <laughs> Glancing over the board, you see several possible strategies. Pressing more workers into service would increase your economic output and help you to survive a possible conflict with the lieutenant. Or you could ignore your labor supply and focus on fulfilling contracts for points and resources. Those aren't your only options. You could also show your workers how much you appreciate them by investing some of that wealth in them. After all, they're the ones producing wealth for the suzerain. It might keep my morale. <laughs> well, sure, you can do that. It's just not a terribly effective strategy, but then it's up to you. <laughs> I'm bored with this. Let's finish the game later. Kim, what should I do? Invest in your existing workers, press more workers into service, focus on fulfilling contracts. Invest in your existing workers. To the lieutenant's puzzlement, you spend several turns building various Such a bad improvements idea. to your territorial infrastructure. Soon, your workers have access to clean water, <laughs> paved roads, and basic hobbies. In return, they produce <laughs> one extra resource per turn. Gaze on your workers like a benevolent parent. <laughs> mm. Too bad investing in your workers just isn't worth many points. What do you mean? Take a look at the scoring tables in the back. Lieutenant turns to one of those appendices you skipped over earlier. Uh-oh. <laughs> you see in table 8C that investing in territorial infrastructure multiplies your final victory point total by one, which is to say not at all. 
whereas erecting monuments in Revachol gives you a multiplier of five. So you're saying I fucked up? <laughs> so you're saying the values of the ruling class are completely divorced from the well-being of the people who generate their wealth? You're saying I should treat my workers like disposable labor instead? Uh... <laughs> yes, precisely. Now it's the lieutenant's turn to respond. He moves aggressively onto the Safray territory. Soon, his workers are producing a steady supply of extremely valuable apricots. I knew I didn't have a chance. For several turns, you struggle to respond to the lieutenant's burgeoning apricot empire. Eventually, you relocate the majority of your workers to Supramawindi and Saramaritza, where they begin producing a bumper crop of cocaine tokens. You draw a new contract card. According to the text, there's an aristocrat willing to trade a large supply of cocaine for a number of coins and access to a rare bonus. Amplified music uh -oh. worth seven victory points. Really? You've reached a critical strategic juncture. How do you respond to the lieutenant's <laughs> aggression? Um, okay, I had to, like, oh my god, really wrestle with my laptop to get recording again. Okay. Uh, let's go for that cocaine shipment. Rock and roll, baby. It takes several turns, but you slowly begin accumulating the cocaine <laughs> necessary to complete the contract. When you do, it practically rains cardboard coins on your side. Yes. ka Kim. Stack the coins in a neat little pile to annoy the lieutenant. <laughs> Despite your conspicuous display of wealth, the lieutenant still has a formidable store of coins and resources. True. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rest too easy just yet. The end game is upon you. How will you spend the vast resources you've acquired for the glory of the suzerain? Oh boy. Uh flipping through the manual, you find the most expensive structure in the game. The Revisholian victory column, worth twelve victory points. If you can successfully build it, victory will be all but assured. Mm. Alternatively, you could try launching a trade war to crush the lieutenant's economy, or you could blow all that money on a public education system for your <laughs> worker tokens. The choice uh. is yours. <laughs> it's on, Kim. Launch a trade war. For almighty Revishol, go for the victory column. Build a public education system for your workers. <laughs> Um, it's on, Kim. The lieutenant nods <laughs> gravely as you erect tariffs oh, no. against his apricots and sugar. This is going to get ugly. <laughs> With every turn, tariffs are raised until neither you nor the lieutenant are producing any income uh -oh. or generating resources for the suzerain. We both lose, yay! Even in the best of cases, it's impossible to really win a trade war. But this is far from the best case, and the lieutenant's apricot-powered economic engine I crushes yours. Soon, your coffers are empty, and the map lies strewn with your worker tokens. Damn I hope it. you learned your lesson. The lieutenant says with a sharp smile. Yeah, I never get involved in a trade war in the insulin di Yeah, I never play board games. <laughs> no trade war. Never fuck with Kim Kitsuragi. Holy shit, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> now, let's tell you up the scores, shall we? Uh huh. Computing the final scores is almost a game unto itself. You each spend an inordinate amount of time making stacks of coins, consulting tables, and struggling with basic addition and multiplication. <laughs> After double, then triple checking your maths. You have your final score. Negative five victory points. You'd be lucky <laughs> if the suzerain doesn't have your whole family executed for such a pitiful performance. Uh-huh. I've got 15 points. <laughs> oh, the lieutenant looks up from his tabulations. He says with a slight smirk on his face. Don't look too glum, detective. There's always next time. Figuratively, I mean. There's no way we have time to play this game again. Now, let's clean up and get back to work. You hold the open game box before you. 
You open up a number of pouches containing wooden tokens. You All hold right. the open. Can we can't play it again. I want to play it again. <laughs> that was really funny. I did horrible, but it's accurate because I don't know how to play those types of games. And I'm horrible. I've tried playing those types of games in real life and I just suck at it. <laughs> Never fuck with Kim Kitsuragi. Yep. <laughs> Lesson learned. Did I ever look at this? The bullet mushroomed out on impact. Did I look at it? The bullet is safely sealed away in a plastic bag bearing the RCM stamp. Kim has filled out the label on the bag with the item number, case number, and date and location the bullet was found. I don't know if I checked this. Beside his orderly handwriting, the bullet looks especially sad, like a tiny, shriveled head of cauliflower. What do I do with you, bullet? Feel the bullet through the bag. The squashed bullet has some sharp edges <clears throat> where the jacket has split open. It feels cold, even through the bag. What do I do with you, bullet? What? <laughs> Lieutenant steps closer. I said, what do I do with you, bullet? Well, if I was the bullet, which I'm not, I would say, find the weapon that shot me. Good idea. If we find who owns it, possibly to kill our victim. In conclusion, the more we know about this bullet of yours, the better. Inspect the bullet. The jacket of the bullet is made of a yellowish metal. It has blossomed out <laughs> to reveal a dark gray core. The base of the bullet is close to five millimeters in diameter. Look at the jacket. You can just about make out a few strations near the base of the bullet. Little hairlines, linear. It feels standard. Uh, in the core? It's quite destroyed. Some of the fragments are still lodged in the wound. What can you say about the bullet so far? <laughs> wow, I actually know this. It's a jacketed bullet close to five millimeters in diameter. A jacketed bullet. Okay. It would have been shot from a military-grade breech-loading rifle, not from a muzzle loader like mm. those typically found on the streets of Martinez. We were right. This came from a serious weapon. This was planned out. Even the RCM uses ordinary injected conical bullets. This is strange. Very strange. I like this, officer. Strange means unique. Unique means incriminating. We need to find a gun that shot it. Something tells you that won't be any time soon. This will have to be one of those epic tasks that's open mm. for a while. Legendary. I'm pretty high up there, though. Try to determine what type of weapon shot this. Hold on. Is there anything I can do to up my hand-eye coordination? I do have a skill point, but I... I'm gonna save it. Unless I fail this check. Doesn't look like I can. Okay. Let's try it. Where's the bullet? Oh, here it is. Away, Let's try it. In a plastic pack, a rifle. Yes. Revolutionary period. Your bullet looks to be an old 4.46 millimeter from the surplus left over from the turn of the century. Hmm. Probably an antique or a retrofitted antique. Like the one that I have in my inventory? The 4.46 caliber was widely used with the Belma Grave rifle, a Revacholian manufacturer. The BM dominated the battlefields of the Insel Indian Theater of the Anti-Centennial Revolution 50 years ago. The one that I have in my inventory? Incidentally, you have just such a yeah. rifle with you. The dusty old thing you found hidden in the basement below the commercial area. It's unusable, sadly. If it were, the bullet would probably fit the chamber. Is anyone still making these rifles? No, but Zeliger, a major firearm manufacturer, ended up with a surplus after the war. So there are still a lot of these old military rifles floating around, usually broken. The quality was appalling. Who uses Belmagrav rifles these days? Antiques enthusiasts, guerrilla fighters in distant countries, a few lucky jamrock bangers. You're looking for the same thing you found in that hidden weapons cache. Hmm. Only in working order. Hmm. What are you thinking? Bullet? The lieutenant jots something down in his notebook. I think I know where this came from, dangled a bag thoughtfully. Okay. And? The shot probably came from a Velmagrav rifle. I mean, I have some ideas, but I can't be sure. <laughs> I was just teasing him at that point. An antique. That makes sense. There can't be many breech-loading rifles floating around in Martinez, or anywhere in Ravachon, really. 
That's probably a good thing. I have to hand it to the monarchs. It's quite admirable that they took the advice of criminologists last century and banned the use of breech loaders in peacetime. Some new RCM recruits get impatient with their muzzle loaders once they've trained with military grade weapons, but they realize it's worth it in the end. Uh, worth what? Getting shot? I think we should have more powerful guns. We're the law. Makes you consider every shot. I like it. Imagine if everyone, cops, citizens, had access to firearms that could shoot multiple rounds without pausing to reload. After the first shot, the second, third, and so on come much easier. But back to the investigation. Seems like he has a lot of experience in this. Seems like we're looking for an antique enthusiast. Could the victim have been mixed up with some foreign guerrilla fighters? Well, have well-armed Jamrock bangers started crossing over into Martinez? Something mysterious is afoot with this antique bullet type. Uh, even mix up with foreign guerrilla fighters? Let's find out. Next step, finding the gun itself. Uh, okay. I don't know where to start with that, though. Okay, white envelope. Let's look at it. Take the legal documents out of the envelope. A 12 to 40 month construction period and the zoning plan in the addendum. Look at the zoning plan. The youth center cuts into the ocean like the bow of some great modern ship. Apparently, it's going to cover most, if not all, of the street and the square between the existing houses. It's three stories tall. I don't like it. Kim, what do you think of this? I'm no property lawyer, but it looks fine. I like the print size. They're not selling or leasing anything. It's not a perfect solution, but... Uh, the lieutenant replies, slipping through the documents. How else are you going to build something? It's always inconvenient to build things, and citizens inevitably have disagreements over such construction projects. But there's no other way. I don't... I don't like it, though. Try to find a loophole. There Ooh. is no loophole. The simple truth is, the current residents are going to lose their street access, and for the next 12 to 40 months, their lives will be dominated by constant construction noise right next door. Wait, what are the ramic ramifications of this? Look at look. Kim points the photocopy. These people are going to have to move away. Can we do something about it? The noise will be tough on the villagers, but I guess that's just the cost of progress. What are the ramifications of this? Once the construction starts, it'll probably take a few months, a year maybe, for even the most stubborn occupants to get tired of living like this. After that, they'll sell their property for cheap and move out. These people are going to have to move away. I should have seen it. The lieutenant frowns as he reads over the document again. Evra probably has eyes on us, but we could try to get other people to sign this instead of those listed. Or you could forge their signatures yourself. By the time he finds out, we'll already be gone. Hmm. <laughs> uh. <laughs> By the time he finds out, we'll be gone. Commence the forgery. All right, Everett's people could be watching you here. Let's put that away for now and figure out where we can go where he won't be watching us. What about in here? I just don't like the idea of doing it for him. I don't trust him. Let's see. You take the legal documents out of the envelope. What? A 12 to 40 month construction period. And All right. Okay. Let's Go somewhere else. <laughs> Alright. Let's go somewhere you probably can't see us. Forge somewhere private where you feel safe enough to sleep. <gasps> I know exactly where that is. Alright. Let's try it. Let's try it. Uh, fisherman Shack. God, if only all of them loaded that fast. <laughs> Alright. Let's try it. I've won a bunch of checks though, so I feel like I'm gonna fail the next one. If that's the case, I'll just up my uh, my uh, skill point there and see if that helps. Because I really don't want to have people sign it. But I don't know if I'll be able to... Like... Um, progress if people don't sign it, you know? Okay, I think it's interfacing. You take the legal documents out of the envelope. Okay. Interfacing. Let's see what I can wear. 
Is that it? That's it? Ugh, okay. We'll try it. You take the legal documents out of the envelope. A 12 to 40 month construction period and the zoning plan in the Oh, addendum. it's a red check. Fuck. I just I just noticed that. Okay. Mmm. Please. You take the legal documents I'm gonna out fail of the it. envelope. With a <gasps> confident flourish, you complete <gasps> your forgery. What do you see on Yay. the signature line? Two names. Isobel Sadie and Lillian Carter. Indeed. They look distinctly different and very convincing. These might as well be their actual signatures. But they're not. Yeah. <laughs> the document will be nullified if they dispute it. That means Everard will have to start over. All you need to do yes. now is mail the signatures to Everard's accountant in La Delta. Yes, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I thought I would fail that one for sure. That just means I will definitely, definitely fail the next check. Alright, so now that we've changed that, let's travel back <laughs> and mail it. Okay. I think I have to talk to the little mailbox. In the morning light, the white on blue police livery on the motor carriage cannot but catch your eye. Wait, why am I even thinking about this? Wasn't I supposed to... Do something important? <laughs> something murder-related? There's always something important. Doesn't mean you can't take a moment to admire this piece of machinery. Even at a standstill, the unibody Caprice Kanema looks sleek and dynamic. Yes, it the does. The cabin is tilted frontward to give it a more aggressive, hunched look. Someone has waxed it recently. <laughs> I wonder who. That machine really puts the loco back in locomotion. Point to the vehicle. Very cool. I don't like your machine, Lieutenant. It looks impractical. Oh my god, that would hurt his feelings so bad. Shrug. A motor carriage. One of many. Actually, motor carriage. Motor carriages don't interest me. The machine really puts the loco back in locomotion. <laughs> mm -hmm. You want to take a closer look? Yes. The lieutenant smiles ever so slightly. He's so proud of it. What's it packing in there? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> What's it packing there? I point to the engine. What in there made the infernal whining sound that woke me? A fine machine. Run your hand over the smooth metal surface. I feel like I shouldn't touch it. What's it packing there? <laughs> 130. I reckon that's a 7 liter V12 there. <laughs> well, out of whistle, Mama's serving some serious macaroni. <laughs> okay, not gonna say that. That's what? Rub your chin. 7 liter V12? Sure. 7.2. Supercharged. <laughs> and the lieutenant is trying to suppress a smug smile unsuccessfully. Saying these words brings him immense joy. Uh, what in there made the infernal whining sound that woke me? You mean the coil noise? What is coil noise? When variable current passes through wires that make up the coils on the electrical system of this machine, it causes vibration in the wires and the cores of the coils. When the frequency of the current in the coils falls within the audible range, the resulting vibration creates the whiny sound you mentioned. Hmm. What a beano clad. Shut up! Whatever you do, don't make fun of the lieutenant no, for explaining this so to you. so mean. That's horrible. If I said that, I, I could not ever face him again. Wow, how do you know all that? Mm -hmm, that's exactly what I thought. How do you know all that? I have pretty much maintained my vehicles by myself ever since one was assigned to me. You inevitably pick up some knowledge on the way. Yeah, but he really enjoys like the engineering side of it, I think. There's pride in there. A trained driver knows his ride. A fine machine. Run your hand over the smooth metal surface. Yes. An extraordinary machine. <laughs> There's a gentleness in the lieutenant's voice as his eyes run over the vehicle's contours. It's nice and all, but why so modest? Put some zing into it. Flare it up. Slam it down. It's a bit girly right now. <laughs> Fit it with some proper off-road components. Oh my god. You need to slam it, Kim. Make it more imposing. With a winch and mud tires, we could take it off a beaten path, Kim. Okay, enough about the details. We could take it off the beaten path. 
We are not going to, though, because this is clearly a sports motor carriage. Sounds like he has a strong concept of what this machine is. Okay, let's try the other yes. thing. <laughs> it's not. It's a bit girly right now. You need to Fits slam it. it. Sorry, I'm not following you. Lingo it up. Drop the ride. Two hundred mil. Get the chamber to frosty frosty. <laughs> Can't. No, I'm not either. I don't know why I said that. Well, maybe don't just say every little thing in your head out loud. It confuses people. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Sorry. I don't I don't know why I said that either. Okay, cool. Okay, what the hell are you? <laughs> Hi. That's one brutal motor carriage. Piss that. That's one brutal motor carriage. Okay. Says a young man with piss bad word written on his back if i were a real skull now i'd jack it paint it in palm tree livery then bottom light it neon style his companion wears a simple yet elegant slogan fuck the world um kids are gonna get mad a snazzy shit ripped skull mobile like this would make a fine trophy we could like hang fucking shrunken heads from the side mirrors cops heads scary tribal shit yeah, uh, tribal shit. A cock carriage like this would have proper skull value. Ahem. <clears throat> While I appreciate the interest you take in my brutal motor carriage, I have to stop you right there. The RCM takes threats directed at its property seriously. He steps in. He is going to kill them. <laughs> I, um, it's just theoretical work, copper. No basis in reality. Man. If we were certified skulls right now. He turns to his companion. Who are you? I can tell you who we're not, cop. We're not snitches. Or skulls. Okay. Which is not to say that the skulls are bitches and On the contrary. The part of this presentation you want to take home with you, cop man, is we're not part of the skulls yet. Okay then, let's indulge in some intellectual exchange. These young men seem eager to share their beliefs. Okay. Uh, do you guys know Cindy the Skull? That's what I was thinking. Who are the Skulls? You don't know? <clears throat> what kind of cop are you? It's not a question. Don't I'm so glad you- <laughs> So glad you asked. Of course I do, I'm just testing you boys. No, I really don't. The Skulls are the most vicious gang of the Besmertne. His voice rings with excitement. The nastiest bunch of psychos ever. Jacking carriages and getting into high-speed chases. Possessing an infinite amount of fuck-all swagger, infamous for their non-verbal modus operandi. <laughs> non-verbal? If a skull spots you, he will pull out his dagger and stab you without saying a word. The lieutenant's oh. voice is as calm as usual. A testament to the violence and death he's witnessed through the sight of his firearm. Yikes. They usually occupy the burnt out quarter in Jamrock. Or you can find them loitering around the brightly painted bottom lighted vehicles. Ah, uh, <laughs> I can't wait to become a skull. Bottom lights are wretched aggressive. Do you know anything about the murder that took place there? Point to the yard. You guys know Cindy the Skull? Oh, yeah. Cindy's a right proper skull. The young man's eyes glaze over, his voice filled with longing. Yeah! A true artist of the future. Just like Arno Van Eyck. They like her? The other guy lights up too. Uh, by the way, if you see Cindy, give her our regards. He adds, returning from whatever void he was just visiting. For all their nihilistic posturing, these young men are not lacking in youthful idealism. Odd. There isn't a hint of hate in them. It's like they're piss and fuck the world out of some kind of moral obligation. The lieutenant on your left is unusually lenient toward them. Hmm. It's interesting. They don't seem like that bad of dudes, so. I see you kids are into anodic dance music. Why aren't there more skulls in Martinez? Your rhetoric is confusing. Are you part of skulls or not? We're not franchise skulls. Well, not yet. Once we get our name out there, we'll have a chance to join them. And what makes you think the organization would accept you? 
because we can be just as psycho and vicious. You'll see. <laughs> ah, you'll see for sure once we're in. It's the last thing you'll ever see before the void consumes you. Throw him off his game. Are you implying I might be in some sort of danger? Are you sure a skull would say that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we're only saying practice things for now, so <laughs> we don't mean no harm to the Skulls brand, or to you. This is definitely <laughs> something the Skulls would say, but we're not trying to encroach on the Skulls brand in any way. On the contrary, we're just here to market it. <laughs> Hold on, why does a criminal gang need marketing? So you're just pretending to be nasty and vicious as the Skulls? Hey, we can be just as hard. Like pavement on top of pavement. Or a brick on top of another brick. Yeah. Or a grave on top of a grave. These kids have the vocabulary, <laughs> but might be missing a brain. Oh my god. Wouldn't a grave on top of a grave be just a big hole? What's hard about holes? <laughs> Filling them up, baby. <laughs> it's always funny when my the different parts of my brain interact with each other like that. I see your kids are into anodic dance music. Oh man, yeah! We're not fucking kids, man! He exclaims and stops himself, processing the rest of your question. Be wary of the abyss. His blonde friend adds ominously and points to his temple. Why? Probably because of how non-verbal their mode of operation is going to be. It's a threat. And the attendant answers for the two rebels. A threat? Good, I like those. Don't fuck with me, boys. I'm one of the bad cops. I just wanted to talk about music and now there's a conflict of all- oh, all of a sudden, it's too much. Nervously shake your head. Uh... <laughs> None of these are good options. Threat? Good, I like those. But I don't. <laughs> In fact, I dislike them so much I'm willing to drag you boys back to the station just to calm myself down. Okay... <laughs> Lieutenant interjects quickly. Hey, uh, there's no need for that. We're just talking here. Joking, too. Stay light, man. Yeah. Didn't you cops, like, have some questions about skulls or some shit? <laughs> Why aren't there more skulls in Martinez? The Union does their share of policing in Martinez, at least where gangs are concerned. That's why there isn't much organized crime around here. Lieutenant replies instead. Apart from the Unions themselves, of course. Yeah. Don't you worry about that. We're gonna make up for the deficit. Yeah, we are. The young man exchange approving nods. Okay, enough about that. Mm-hmm. He throws a longing ga glance at the Kanema. Do you know anything about the murder that took place here? Murder? A man was hanged in the backyard of the Whirling in Rags. Yeah, sure. We'll gladly tell you everything we know about it. <clears throat> it was a man. He clears his throat. Also, he was hanged. Don't fuck around, I am the law. <laughs> He was hanged from a tree. Yeah, I mean, duh. These punks don't know anything. Let's just move along. All right. Hey, stop right there. How does one know anything? I'm not going to entertain you with this any longer. Sure, sure. Understandable. Fuck and I appreciate your <laughs> effort, though. That's, that's their nicknames. The blonde man says, quickly nodding. What's with the jackets? What about them? Turn to the blonde youth. Why does your jacket have piss written on it? Turn to the dark-haired youth. What do you- why do you have fuck the world written on your jacket? Like I said before, many men keep searching for the one. For so-called true love, which is actually just obsession masquerading as kinship. The thrill of the chase. The hollowness that fills your chest cavity after catching it. I'm wondering if the poetics come with the jacket. Or are they derived from something else entirely? To catch a fish, you'll need to hurl the law many times. And even then, it isn't certain that you'll get anything. If you blow up the lake, though... It's a terrible metaphor. <laughs> you get more fish in a shorter time. And for time is of the essence and fleeting ever so quickly, one must think of a way to fuck the whole world and not get caught up in fucking some one. Logic. Because when one fucks everything, he fucks nothing. And that, to me, feels glorious. Sticking your dick into the void. Hate to admit it, but in a weird way, 
He's got a point. No, he doesn't. <laughs> Turn to the blonde youth. Why does your jacket have that written on it? Well, first off, it's a statement and not necessarily something that characterizes me as a person, even though the statement has character. And I do like piss. The word <laughs> piss epitomizes the struggle taking place in the world. Things being defined as they seem, not as they are. And I guess it's also about communal spirit, the future, and truly appreciating our differences. Uh-huh. Also, you've got to admit, it catches the eye. And since the Grand Piper is slowly but steadily moving towards basing the economy on it, attention, it is imperative that the medium <laughs> itself convey the message. Uh, what? What I mean by this is, we are all pissed <laughs> and that the world is inherently meaningless. Is it a coincidence that here we have two badass jackets and two <laughs> badass cops? No. <laughs> no. We don't need them. Hey, Kim, lower your voice. Yes? Do you think it's a coincidence? Why, these? That there are two of us and two of these jackets? What are you implying? The lieutenant looks confused. Which one would you wear? <laughs> you know what I'm implying. We should get those jackets. Which one would you wear? I'm not sure I understand you, detective. Are you more of a piss or a fuck the world kind of guy? Neither. <laughs> Come on, kid, it's just a mental exercise. Fine, if only to end this discussion. Theoretically, if I were a juvenile delinquent, if I were to already be down that path, I think piss <laughs> is the stronger of the two statements. <laughs> this episode has opened up a whole new level of Kim. No way, if anything, I'm the pissed in this scenario. That works. I feel like more of a fuck the world kind of guy. Seems about right, especially considering your heroic exit attempts. The lieutenant remarks. That's an origin story for a dynamic duo right there. <laughs> so are we done here? Or you don't need us around for your secret whisper party, do you? Oh my god. As for the jackets... For yourself and the lieutenant. Oh my lord. <laughs> Let's not do that right now. I don't feel like it's gonna work. Let's quick save it. <laughs> um, we don't need those right now, I don't think. That is really funny though. <laughs> The dented yellow mailbox greets you with its graffito and bullet holes in the front. I knew we'd get to the, use this mailbox for something. Yes, for sending mail. Exactly. Drop the white envelope into the mailbox. You drop the white envelope in the darkness. It lands with a soft thud on what sounds like a couple of letters. About a week's worth of mail as collected in there. They'll empty this very soon. Probably did the right thing. You can't trust that slug ever up. You know he's going to play you somehow. That's what I'm saying. All right, let's go back to Everard. If we don't mention anything to him, he won't know before it's too late. Agreed. Oh God, I really want those jackets. <laughs> it's half light, right? I can only ask once. That's the thing. Ugh. That ride is... Hey, piss! Look who it is! Shrunken cophead material! Maybe if we talk to Cindy first, she'll tell us a little more. Let's go talk to Everett for now. I only have 91 cents, I just re remembered that. Shit. <laughs> okay, I can't imagine Kip wearing a jacket. After we talk to him, maybe we can do the phasmid thing. Or we could try to set up the rave thing. Alright. Hey dude, we totally did the task that you wanted us to do. <laughs> Mr. Dubois, I hear the meeting with Titus was a glowing success. That's such a relief. Titus can be a handful sometimes. His grin widens. Now, what can Everett Claire do for you today? Okay, um... It turns out the strikers were being served an alcoholic brew. I stopped this madness. I'm just gonna get that out of the way. I don't know what that means, Harry, but I love it. <laughs> I love your initiative. 
Knowing you're out there keeping things running lets me focus on the big picture stuff. He chuckles. Don't even tell me what was going on. Alcoholic brew, stronger, stopped it, strike. I'm just going to let you surprise me, Harry. Uh, let's talk about my lost gun. Yes, your lost gun. My best men are on it. They're turning every stone, searching every playground, asking kids, grandmas, everyone. <laughs> your gun will be found, Harry. Let me assure you of that. It's just a matter of time and effort. He winks at the you. The only way to find it seems to be working with him. He might even be holding your gun hostage. Hold on, could he really be holding my gun hostage? Wait, the gun may have been bought from Roy's pawn shop. Have your men factored that in? I will not be blackmailed with this gun business. I don't care about my gun, keep it. Does this mean if I do things for you, I will get my gun back? Could he really be holding my gun hostage? Who knows? Only one thing is certain. If you work with him, you're going to get it back. And working with him might be the only way to do it. Wait, the gun may have been bought from Roy's pawn shop. Have your men factored that in? Yes. Thank you for the hot tip regarding your lost gun, Harry. My men have indeed factored in that you pawned it. He makes air quotes. Now please, let the professionals do their job. Kick back, Harry, relax. I have great guys on this. You focus on what's important. Building our relationship for the good of Martin Ames. It did not come as a surprise to him. He might actually not be bullshitting. I will not be blackmailed with this gun business. Harry, Harry. I was only trying to be tactful. A lost gun is a dangerous thing. I can't have it around in my neighborhood. Kids could be playing gun roulette with it as we speak. Teenage mm -hmm. gangs could be arming themselves. Get a hold of yourself, Harry. I assure you we are working on locating the missing sidearm as well. The lieutenant is concerned about the lost gun and feels that the fact you haven't prioritized looking for it is unfortunate, if inevitable, and doesn't put the RCM in a good light. Okay, I'm sorry. Excellent, Mr. Kitsuragi. That's excellent news. Looks like we have a friendly gun-finding competition on our hands. He clasps his hands together. Okay, fine. What's um... that, Harry? You're getting a little pale. Is it the words paranoid schizophrenic and lost gun in one sentence? Don't worry, it's just a lead. It'll probably turn out to be nothing. Okay. It's done. I mailed the signatures you asked to get me to the mail. The golden boy returns once more. Wonderful. Simply wonderful, Harry. Of course. I already knew this. He claps his hands together like a child who's just been offered cotton candy. My friend, the mailman... Confirms the letter is on its way. You've done a great thing today. You've given the children of Martinez a real future, Harry. And I feel I can finally trust you now. Uh huh. You're in my inner circle. You too, Mr. Kitsuragi. We can talk about anything. The strike, the murder, your lost gun. Nothing oh, wow. is off the table. He nods to the Lieutenant, smiling broadly. Oh, Bratan, you play the old man like a three string banjo. He has no idea! Better not <laughs> gloat, sire. Tis arrogance that gives the play away. Be subtle. Mm-hmm. The signatures I got. I know you plan to force them out with construction noise. No, let's not talk about that. Did you order the hangman killed? I did not, Harry. Although I am very, very glad he's dead. He shakes his head energetically. What did you gain? What do you gain from him being dead? Why a war, of course. Shit. It seems like he likes the fact that the the workers are on strike. There's people the the scabs are trying to get in. He wants all this chaos. I just don't know why. I know that war is very profitable. That's just a fact. I mean, even in real life. Um So is that his play? Huh. And what do you have to gain from a war? Victory, Mr. Kitsuragi. I have victory to gain. We are going to start a war with the Wild Pines group and win before they even realize there is a war. They're trained military people. Aren't you afraid for your men? Harry, we outnumber them 1,500 to 1. And that's just Martin Ames. With all the unions in Rebeshal and with public opinion on our side, we can hold off two men. 
or 15 men, or even 50 men. It took eight guys to kill a guy. Well, that's not true. They shot him. But why did it take all eight of them? The more they send, the worse it's going to look for them. They made a huge mistake hiring those guys. No one likes foreign mercenaries. The leftists hate them. The fascists hate them. Even the moralists think they're in bad taste. How is this connected to the strike? Harry, there is no strike, only war. Class war. Or, in business terms, a dawn raid. Or wait. Is that when you still pay them something? Because we won't do that. He pauses to rub his chin. We're not gonna give nothing. We're gonna take Terminal B away from them. The roads, the gates, the containers, that big crane, even the damn coffee maker. We're gonna take all of it for the people and fuck Wild Pines. The word fuck rings like a gunshot from his mouth. He doesn't swear often. So that's why you haven't let Joyce in? Yes. It's also why I let that midget Gormont go. He's too nice. I can't put him through this. Plus, he knows how to get in here. That woman can't tell her tits from her asshole. She has no chance. Gormont? Midget. I don't know who he's talking about. What? It's from her arsehole. No, uh, not it's a that. Local saying. Not that. Actually, no, it's not. Why are you telling me your plans? Because we're friends, Harry. Besides, it doesn't matter now. You can go tell her if you want. It won't change the course of events. We have a significant head start. It's already happening. He looks at the swordfish clock and nods. I don't know how to feel about this. I don't know what side I'm e I've even chosen yet. Um, how many guys... How many of you guys are there in the Union? 2,372. Plus yours truly, of course. He replies with, like, a whip. 2,373 is a sizable contingent for a labor organization in Revachon. And they're all well motivated. At least the ones you've seen. How are you going to fund your new independent harbor? Oh, you mean what sort of goods are going to be flowing through? How am I going to replace all the contacts we'll lose once the poo-poo hits the fan? The clients will ditch us. Harry, we've thought of everything. Archer's barking, I'm sorry. <laughs> everything? We've been running back channel negotiations with all the major clients. I think the company will be unpleasantly surprised to see how many of them stay loyal to Martin A's and to the new competitive contracts we can offer. With renewed zeal sparked by communal ownership, the men will be shipping those containers double time. You'll be surprised to see how fast things go without parasites latching on. We'll have our hands free to pursue bold exotic new revenue streams. So if he didn't order the man dead, who did? That's drugs. Yeah. Drug trafficking. Mm-hmm. Drug trafficking? Don't be stupid, Mr. Kitsaragi. There are perfectly legal, 100% ethical chemical factories on the Samarin Isola. You don't need to be colonialist about it. All they do is produce components to keep the pharmaceutical industry running. That's people's health we're talking about. Old grannies, little babes, people with disabilities. That's just the top of the iceberg though, isn't it? God, that sounds shady. Digging it, Everard, I had to say I'm digging this part. That sounds shady. The company thinks transporting these chemicals in bulk looks bad. Has bad optics. May be illegal in some countries. The Debardes Union, however, we're all about the large volume column. We're gonna transport the living daylights out of those materials, Harry. So your sick kid can get his benefit and your wacky uncle doesn't have to come off Risperazole. He slams his fist on the desk once more. And the kids on the street can get speed and pyrolidone. I'm an old-fashioned guy, Mr. Kitsuragi. I sometimes grab a beer with the boys, but I have no idea about the things you just mentioned. Sure. But if I were to supply ingredients for some sort of rainbow party, I would make sure the Union took a fantastic share, and I'd keep that stuff far away from Martin A's. Drugs are a no-go for me. I'll report this. I have to admit, that's a well-put-together plan and far removed from you. Interesting stuff. I just want to solve this murder, okay? Makes sense to regulate the drug trade like this. Keeps it out of more dangerous hands. I just want to solve this murder, okay? You know why you're such a good detective, Harry. You don't get sidetracked. 
You care about the people you're supposed to protect, not some systems that may or may not be unethical. Anyway, let's not focus on the sensationalism of the drug trade. This hypothetical drug trade is all anyone ever seems to be interested in. It would only be a small part of the harbour's turnover, just like the harbour is, but a small part of Martin A's. It would still be illegal. Let's look at the big picture. Martin A's as a whole. There are little girls out there with dreams of making music. Young mothers who want to start businesses. Models who want to walk catwalks and steel welders who want to weld steel. I'm going to unite them all into one economic body. We're going to incorporate this place to kingdom come. Everyone's going to be in on the wealth. And everyone's going to pull their weight. It sounds like something that's not going to happen. <laughs> Let's keep focusing on the drug trade. He was almost admitting to it. Uh, hold on. I don't want to look at the big picture. I want to look at the drug trade you almost admitted to. Well, I mean, if it has the word incorporate in it, then I like it. I'm a money guy. It's very ambitious. I love what you're doing for the working man. I'm not feeling the whole re whole. I'm not feeling a whole lot of revishal here. Not of flags or kings. Honestly, it's not my place to judge or express opinion. <laughs> uh, I want to look into the drug trade. No, no, Harry. That's boring. All right, it's gone. The hypothetical raw materials trade is off the table. It's such a small and insignificant slice of revenue, I'm cutting it. Boys. Harry felt queasy about it. We're not <laughs> doing it. Can we talk about my beautiful incorporated Martin A's and its many-sided business ventures now? This bold new vision of incorporated socialism I'm offering. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to stay completely neutral like I have been through the whole game. Honestly, it's not my place to judge or express opinion. <laughs> Harry, the length you're willing to go to keep your nose clean is remarkable. You will always have a warm bed in Mr. Clare's household, my friend, and a special place in the future of Martin A's. He stares at you lovingly. Um, can I ask about specific union members? Can I get my gun now? Harry, I've got to be honest with you. Your gun was found two days Fucking ago. It. Withholding this information weighed heavily on me. But it had to be done. You bastard. Your gun is with an old woman. I hear she's a character, so watch out. Is it the old lady at the apartment? This must be the woman who bought the gun from oh. Roy. The one he described as terrifying. It's Kuno S, isn't it? So the gun's still with the woman who bought it from Roy. Yes, the same one. I see you've done your research. The pawn shop made the gun easy to track. Crazy stuff, Harry. Selling your gun like that? Wild. Anyway. <laughs> he smiles and shakes his head in wonderment. Union boy's gonna help you fix it. He winks at you. Don't worry, Harry. The neighbors of this old woman contacted me. Oh, it's an old woman, okay. Because they trust me and the Debardeurs Union. Apparently, she was waving it around at the entrance to her building. It is the old lady, okay. Waving the gun around doesn't sound good. None of this does. She was waving it around at people? Who is this old woman? Who? She was waving it? As I said, she's a character. I didn't have time for details. It sounds like she's unstable, but don't worry. No one got hurt. He smiles. It sounds like a very disturbed and desperate individual. Who is this old woman? Unfortunately, I don't know anymore. You're gonna have to go in blind, Harry. But she's an old lady. How dangerous can she possibly be? Oh, and she calls herself the pigs. This doesn't make any sense. There it is again. The pigs. Like Roy said, not good at all. I, for one, find it refreshing. Finally, someone calls themselves a pig. A smile flickers in the corner of his mouth. It actually sounds extremely bad, but let's not give him the satisfaction. <laughs> Can you set up a meeting? I already have. Tonight, starting 10 o'clock, near the old fish market on the coast. The one on the boardwalk, a little past the fishing village. Be careful, Harry. I would never set you up for anything dangerous, but you did ask for this. Now, back to the fun stuff. He claps his hands. She will be there from 2200 hours till 0200 hours. More fun stuff. Seems like we already have fun stuff to do. Hmm. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll be there near the fishing village. Can I ask about the specific union members? We're way past specific union members now. This is the big time. We're talking about the future of Revachol here, Harry. 
You can bother Leonard with that. He loves to run his mouth on such matters. <laughs> but I'm in big time mode, Harry. He points to the door. There's something different about him now. He's more vibrant, more alive in his big time mode. All right. Great, Harry, great. I think we have truly built a bridge between Martinez and Jamrock today. We have united the RCM and the Debardes Union. Suddenly there's sadness in his tone. This has been so great. I'm sorry we don't have more fun things to do together, but if you ever feel like bouncing something off me, my door is always open. He points to you, then himself. Uh... Can we go over the few details concerning the murder again? Most certainly, oh, wait. Harry. Nothing okay. by your means, Harry. That. What's on your mind? What's in that container outside your office? My dear Harry, there are literally millions <laughs> of containers in this harbor. I couldn't possibly remember what's in all of them. There's something special about it. It was attached to the Xvalsen crane? Harry, you smooth-talking son of a bitch. <laughs> Time is a precious resource, and I don't have enough of it to count containers with you. He says in the fondest of smiles. Smooth talking. Maybe that's the way to go about opening the container. You should at least try convincing it. A few more questions about the harbor. I'm always happy to educate and entertain you, my friend. Mm -hmm. Very nice, Harry. My dear Harry. I rarely do, Harry. I have people for that. Now... You were saying? Uh, I met Joyce, a company representative. Oh, that's very nice. I haven't gotten around to her yet. I'm very, very busy, you see. You just... I hope you're getting along. <laughs> he just a button on his sleeve. One thing I want to make very clear, Harry, is that this is not some kind of union versus corporation situation. Everyone is just pals here. <laughs> he literally just admitted to wanting to start a war with her, but okay. We're all trying to do what's best for Martinez. Don't feel like you can't cooperate with her because you and I are such good friends and I helped you get the body down. And I'm helping you find your gun. <laughs> I'm not a jealous guy. Whoa, that's so nice of him. Suspiciously nice. Are you sure? I find it a little odd. I told Joyce that I met you. What happened to the previous negotiator, Mr. Gamon? What do you mean, Harry? Nothing. I let him go. Big man sounds annoyed. He made concessions for the company in previous ne negotiations. Why would you let an ally like that go? He's an old man, Harry. I wanted him to spend more time with his family. God knows how long he's got left. He looks down and sighs. You called him a midget. Harry! I have little people in my organization. I would never call someone a midget. What is this? He exclaims indig indignant. Honestly, I'm beginning to think you're a midget, Harry. I'm only kidding, Harry. You're not a midget. No one is. We're pals. <laughs> Abruptly, he smiles and changes his tone. Um, why haven't you let her in to see you? If she actually wants to see me, she will find a way. Any good negotiator would. And I just don't have anything to discuss with a bad negotiator. He doesn't want to see her. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Okay. Of course, Harry. Let me just assure you one more time. It's perfectly okay to share anything we discuss here with this Joyce. This is a completely transparent organization. I have no interest in what she is doing, but I myself have nothing to hide. Your business is your business and I respect your privacy. Just remember, none of this is secret. He makes an all-encompassing gesture. Tell her about all of it. My brother's picture, my singing swordfish clock. <laughs> Tell her how overweight I am and how I'm helping you find your lost gun. Tell her about everything. Everett doesn't mind. It is rather interesting to tell people things about each other, isn't it? It was nice telling him about her right now. I don't like it. I'm not telling her anything. Oh. This whole situation is really rough. I, I feel like I'm doing everything wrong, but that's okay. Front the pigs and get your gun back. Someone's been running around with your sidearm pretending to be a police officer. You must meet her in the old fish market at 2200 and get your service weapon back. Just walk past the fishing village until you see the boardwalk. Uh, Alright, let's get out of here. Hmm, maybe we can talk to Leo a little bit. 
Maybe he'll tell something. Tell us something important. Hey, Leo. Oh, hey, mister. I knew you'd be back to talk with old Leo here. Yes, I okay. did. Yeah. No trouble at all, mister. No trouble at all. It's like that old saying goes, wisdom withers if not shared. And old Leo is always up for sharing. Leo, you seem to know everyone around here. I want to ask about someone. Mr. Evra oh, doesn't geez. really want me to talk to people about Union guys. But who did you want to talk about? Tell me about this Edgar guy you keep mentioning. Mr. Edgar is Mr. Everett's brother. He looks a bit younger, he does. But a very smart fellow. Very smart fellow indeed. He's away on some Union business. Not even in Revishaw, they say. Don't interrupt him. All kinds of places he visits. Him and his brother both do when they're on a vacation. Right now, it's Mr. Everett's turn to look after the Union. But last year, he spent a whole winter in South Africa. <laughs> he chuckles. Left with the first autumn rains and didn't come back before the trees were green again. <laughs> okay, tell me about Manana. He's a Union man through and through. Good guy. He's very calm, laid back, doesn't do much, <laughs> talks to Everett sometimes. He falls silent, hesitating. Honestly, I don't know what he does for us, <laughs> but it must be important because everybody likes him. Yes, they do. I think that's what he does. He makes everyone feel a little better. This guy is painfully innocent. Oil for the wheels. Much needed in stressful times like these. Tell me about Measurehead. Whoa, he's really something. <laughs> he doesn't talk much to me usually, but when he does, I don't really understand most of what he's saying. Actually, I don't think he would like me running my mouth about him like that. <laughs> he suddenly falls silent. Once he said he's a dragon to this mob fellow who came picking a fight with some union men. Huh. I think he really believes Jean Luc was a dragon because he ran right off. Another time he almost killed another guy, but I shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> uh, tell me about Titus. Oh, Titus is a long shoreman through and through. He was born on a boat, they say. His veins are probably filled with salt water, I tell you. <laughs> Nice, friendly sort old Titus is. <laughs> sure. The little man rubs a patch on his elbow. His veins... Oh, he already said that. Uh, tell me about Everard. Uh, I'd best not. I mean, I could, but I don't think Mr. Everard would like it very much. You better ask him yourself, mister. If anything, the ever-present smile on Leo's face gets even warmer. Tell me about Renee. The night guard. Ooh, he's a peculiar fellow. He's the strong, silent type, you could say. Leo looks at the guard booth on the wall. We talk all the time, but I don't really know much about him. He plays petanque with my old human studies teacher, Mr. Martin, down at the plaza. <laughs> I think he's the only fellow who actually knows old Renee. They lived on the same street their entire lives. Even dated the same girl on and off for as long as I can remember. <laughs> Strange fellows. Mr. Martin was always real nice to me in school. I remember once. Hold up. Gaston was your human studies teacher? Mr. Martin, yes. Don't really remember much about him. I was just a boy back then. Aw. Okay. Uh, sure, mister. What can Leo do for you? The expression on his wrinkled face says, I really want to help you. Leo is the sweetest. Oh my god, he's so adorable. I hope we don't have another plot twist like we did with Elizabeth, where he's actually not a good guy. I really hope not. <laughs> I want him to be a good guy. Is there anything more to this? You're back before the cargo container. <laughs> its draw has not lessened since you were last here. If anything, it seems to have grown slightly. Been in the world for two days, been in the world for many days. <laughs> Let's try it. I know I'm gonna fail. Why are you even trying to open a door with rhetoric? Yeah, why am I? Why are you what? The lieutenant looks startled. Anything at all. Never mind. <laughs> are you satisfied, detective? The lieutenant nods. No, I'm not, because I still didn't open the door, but whatever. It's fine. So I want to talk to Cindy. Hello again, officers. Have you come to admire my mural? Piss and fuck the world's on their best. I don't believe it. I've never known those boys to have manners. The bemusement in her voice doesn't fully mask genuine tenderness. 
They seem to hold you in high esteem. I think they're afraid of you. Maybe it's just skull solidarity. I did... Ma I made up the sending their best part, but I did talk to them. They seem to hold you in high esteem. They'll never be skulls, but... But their hearts are in the right place. She softens. Skulls are cool. Can I be a skull? Skulls are silly. Why? What are you even trying to achieve? Can I be a skull? Fat chance. But you can still do your part to revitalize the neighborhood. Okay, then how's that? She throws you a conspiratorial glance, then presses her finger to her lips and squints up at the sky, as though straining to hear something in the distance. Have you noticed the quiet? Every so often, you might hear a gunshot pierce the air somewhere in Jamrock. But in Martinez, no gunshots, no sirens. The people are languishing in boredom and complacency. That's a good thing, Cindy. This place is a sepulcher. We'll paint it red. We bring the raucous. You bring the sirens. Okay, great. <laughs> I don't really care. Alright, I was hoping it would give me more bonuses so I have a better chance of stealing those jackets, but that's okay. So I went back up here. I doubt there's really anything I can do up here. Wait a minute. Crowbar time. Well. Damn it. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> Never mind. Sunday friend. Dude who hit on me. This door is made of metal and appears to be reinforced. Damn it! Should we ask those guys if we can have their jackets? I feel like I'm gonna fail it. If, if I fail it, I fail it, you know? I don't- I don't need the jackets, I guess. I have to upgrade a half-light. Threaten people. <laughs> Alright. Hi guys! This is not gonna work. That ride is fucking lightning! Hey! Piss! Look who it is! Shrunken cophead material! No, <gasps> no, no. Don't ask anything. Be subtle <laughs> and scary. The boys dream about being skulls. Use that. Wait, how? Suggest they're massive skulls. Come on. Boys with those with those skull jackets, you're gonna be skull kings in no time. What? No! Skulls don't have kings. <laughs> I think. And we're not even in yet. Yeah, man, keep your voice down. Skulls don't take it lightly when folks pretend to be them. We're not even prospects yet. <laughs> Prospect must be a hierarchical term. Raise your voice. Probably in the lower end. Oh, I keep speaking over him, I'm sorry. I'm just excited. Raise your voice. Not even prospects and already aspiring to be kings? Wow, you boys are ambitious. <laughs> Only prospects and already planning a coup in the skulls. You are destined to go far. <laughs> the tenant's voice rings over the plaza. <laughs> he gets it. Passive aggressive flattery. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> are you trying to get us killed? The youth presses through his clenched teeth. There's panic in his eyes. Now bring it to the jackets and, yes, <laughs> start shouting. Yes, we want to be cool killer skulls too like you guys, but we don't have skull jackets. <laughs> Please be quiet. What? What do you want? The jackets? Not much is left of the nihilistic rebel at this point. The young man before you is scared out of his mind. You got it. No need for cruelty. Skull kings, make sh shrunken heads out of us. You offer us your jackets like that? It'd be impolite to refuse. Reach out your hand. L lower your voice. Yes, the jackets. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, I get it. Skulls don't really wear slogans anyway. This was stupid. Oh my god. His shoulders slump over the under the weight of his sadness. Fuck. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. The other one sighs deeply. Oh, wow. <laughs> they look so weird. The lieutenant watches the boys take their jackets off with mild amusement. Are we really going to wear these? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. Turn to Kim. Since you said you're more of a piss 
kind of guy. I'll take the other one. <laughs> um, all right. I'm absolutely okay with not having either one. Thank you. <laughs> Why not? They're a pair. We could really raise hell, go undercover hard. But don't you want to express your individuality? I already am expressing my individuality. I'm not. I don't have a jacket anymore. <laughs> Good. I wanted you not to express yours. Cold-hearted cop. <laughs> I wasn't really expecting Kim to wear it anyway. Well, whatever. I'll take both of them then. Still, it's good to know we have a pair, in case the need arises. The need will not arise. Yes, I will. <laughs> the jackets are meant to complete each other. If a man was standing alone on a street corner with piss written on his back, it'd just be an individual that has taken a liking to you, Ryan. And fuck the world all on its own is, frankly, generic. I don't know, Eric. It's cold out. Eric? The dark-haired young man just stands there defeated. The wind blows. Yeah, let's get out of here. The <laughs> cops fucked us. Oh well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my god. No fucks given. Okay. Oh my god. The leather jacket that quite recently belonged to a young man who possessed some intimate knowledge on the human condition has his numde uh, whatever that word is written on the back, it's quite a statement. Uh, a leather jacket that's quite recently belonged to a hoodlum who understood love for what it really is. It has the hoodlum's non num the gear. I can't say that word written on the back. It's quite a statement. Do you like it? <laughs> You're not gonna wear the other one? Alright. Fine. <laughs> Inside, right. you see a set of steering levers, a radio microphone, a pull-out toolbox, and... Pick up the radio. This is Precinct 57. How may I assist you? Um... Was she doing something? Did you find more about the owner of the armored boots? Still no word, I'm afraid, sir. I know it must be frustrating. Was there anything else you wanted to ask? Oh yeah, connect me to the Jamrock Public Library. Hold on, officer. I've got Central Jamrock Public Library on the line, and I've already introduced you to their librarian. Connecting the call in two, one. Yes, this is Central Jamrock Public Hello. Library here. How can I help you, officer? A male librarian answers the call. He sounds worried, yet ready to assist. This is how people get when the police call. True. <laughs> I'm looking for any information that you can provide on Billy Mijon, a reader. Billy, Billy Mijon, you said. Give me a moment, I'll have to check our database. He puts down the receiver. Yes, hello, are you still there? I found Billy Majon's home address, is that all right? No phone number, unfortunately. You can hear him fiddle with the printout. Dress is good enough for me, dude. They're too poor to have a phone line. Yes, home address is fine. Here we go, sir. Rue de saint Gislaine, 33B, apartment oh. number 20. It's in Martinez, I believe. Capeside Apartments, it says. That's all. That's where the smoker on the balcony lives, hmm. isn't it? Do you have any other information on Billy Mijon? It says here that they returned their last book just a few days ago, but I wasn't at work that day. Do you know someone who was? Marie? Marie? Do you remember a reader named Billy Mijon? They returned a Tibalt book the other day. You hear someone answer from afar. Maurice, what? A woman yells. Then... Yes, yes. Okay. If it was the police... She starts, expla she starts oh. <laughs> explaining something. Why do I think it's my turn to talk? Yes, it, it was my colleague, Marie. Uh, she said that it was Billy's husband who returned the book. He also asked for this new sci-fi release, Lowe's Radio City 87. But we don't have it yet. Oh, so Billy Mijon is the wife? Good. You have a name now. So, Billy Mijon is a woman, not a man. How did your colleague know that it was her husband? Marie knows Billy. She's been working here longer than me. Sometimes her husband returns some books for her. Mm. And then goes for a little drink later. On the lookout. Uh-oh. I'm gonna have to break the news to his wife. Do you know the husband's name? Sorry, no. Marie only knows him by sight. Can Marie describe to me what the husband looks like? Marie! 
A moment passes. She said it was an older man, and that she's pretty sure he'd had a drink or two the last time she saw him. What was he wearing? Uh, one second. Librarian turns away from the phone again and relays the question. Sorry, Marie wasn't really paying any attention to that. Thank you, that's all for me. I have no other questions. Happy we could help. Goodbye, officer. The librarian hangs up and the call gets redirected back to the station with a soft click. Anything else you need from me? Nope. 57th, over and out. In the cabin, you see... Goodbye, Alice. Okay. So, let's go talk to her in that apartment, then. Which is really sad. Deliver the bad news. Oh. I'm gonna take off my jacket when I talk to her, though. I feel like that might be uh, in poor taste. Kim doesn't want to take off his bomber jacket, that's fair. I had to take quite the break because my uh, laptop does things at the speed of nothing. So that's epic. Let me change my jacket. <laughs> So I seem a little bit more professional. Is this it, or is it outside? You hear someone walking around Panel inside. Panel 10. Okay, number 10. That's not it. I feel really bad. I don't really want to tell this. Well, no, we had to tell. But, like, it's going to be sad. One of the biggest gripes I have about this game is the loading time between loading screens. That is really the biggest issue I have, because I don't have many issues with this game. Like, hardly any. But that is one of the big ones that, like, really, like... Ugh. It's kind of a pain. Is this it? A weathered oh, yeah. round door. The number reads 20. Uh. Something smells good. Soup a yo. The lieutenant motions to you to go ahead and knock. He's probably done this many times. This is the door. You already know it's the right door. This is going to be so hard. Don't knock. Just leave. You don't need this. You don't need to sad it up. Hmm. <laughs> well, like I said, Kim has probably done this a hundred times. Hold on, Kim. We should discuss this before we move on. What should we expect? You're right. It's still totally true. He looks at the apartment door and lowers his voice a bit. You hear light footsteps passing by the door and some folk music playing on the radio. We have our first preliminary identification. In all likelihood, the deceased is the husband of Billy Mejean. We need to confirm this, as well as deliver the death notification to Billy herself. Now, delivering a death notification is never an easy task. There's a reason why it's often called the most stressful part of our job. This is why it's usually done in pairs. You got this. I'll be monitoring reactions, ready to act if necessary. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have any advice on how to tell her he's... What if I don't want to do this? Kim, I don't want to do this. Let's turn around. All right, I think I'm ready. Any advice? Dad, just don't say that you know how they feel. You don't. Good advice. Hmm. <laughs> what if I don't want to do this? Yes, it's hard. But there is no easy way to handle this information. It just has to happen. As soon as possible. All right, I'm ready. The lieutenant motions towards the door. Knock. Hello? Who is it? A voice calls up. Her missing husband! Oh, no. And someone turns down the radio. It is her. I had a feeling. Look at the lieutenant first. He gives you a short, encouraging nod. Is this Billy Mejian's home? This is the police. Please open the door. The police? A moment, please. Give us a moment. You hear shuffling inside. Tidy enough. Nervously. There's fear in her voice. Come in. The door is open. I was treating that whole scenario as a joke. I didn't know her husband was actually dead. Oh... Shit. I really wish I didn't, like, push the subject now. Oh my god. Hi. Um. Empty rack of red Astra cigarettes hidden under the bed. No, wait, no, 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 no. Oh, shit. It's you from the book stand. 
Did you come to bring my cockatoo back? She smiles nervously before the smile vanishes from her face. I think she knows. I don't think I introduced myself properly. I'm Billy. Would you like something to drink? Tea? Lemonade? We're out of coffee. The lieutenant has taken off his foggy glasses and is busy cleaning them in his handkerchief for now. You're on your own here. He must feel vulnerable without his glasses. Is this why he's letting you take the lead? Thanks, but I'm alright. <laughs> I'm not really here for the tea. It's not about the cockatoo. Thanks, but I'm alright. Is this about Victor, my husband? Is he in some kind of trouble again? I can come pick him up in the station, if that's what. She stops, her eyes trying to read answers from your face. No. This is something much worse. Is he in a hospital? How bad is it? Something changes in her expression. I hate this. I hate this. How about some small talk before you break the news? Huh. Plus four, Kim is here. Discuss things through with Kim, Lieutenant's handkerchief. So, how have you been? How have I been? You're not here to discuss <laughs> me. Yeah, that's what not a good is idea. this about, officer? Can't write a scene without knowing the actors. Shit. Ask more. Get comfortable around her. One second. I just need to up my... Empathy. <laughs> oh, God. I have to wear these. And, uh... These shoes. And, uh... I can't up my empathy any more than that, so... She looks up, too anxious to say anything. You've done this before. Just keep your focus. God, do I just say he's dead like that? Ma'am, I'm very sorry to say, but your husband, Victor Mijon, was found dead on the board Martinez boardwalk. Do I just say he's dead like that? Yes. That's the most important thing. Use that word. No euphemisms. This is what you came here for. Ma'am, I'm very sorry to say, but your husband, Victor Mijon, was found dead on the Martinez boardwalk. What did you say? She blinks. A great and terrible spike. The blood freezes in her veins. Sucks. <laughs> your husband, Victor Mijon, is dead. I'm very sorry for your loss, ma'am. Oh. She touches her neck, eyes pale like pearls and seawater. Oh. But... He was just... She looks at the kitchen table where two cigarette butts are still in the tray. But he was just here. Alive. Don't make me cry. Alright, don't... Mm -mm. Why am I crying? No, I'm not crying yet. It's fine. We understand this comes as a huge shock. <laughs> I want you to know that me and my partner are here for you if you have any questions. Take your time, ma'am. What happened to him? She turns to you, her neck and cheeks are covered with red blotches, her double chin is shaking. It's still early to say, but at first glance it seems like he slipped and hit his head. It was an accident, he fell through a hole on the boardwalk and hit his head. It's still too early to say, it seems like he slipped and hit his head. Was he drunk? Alcohol may have played a role, yes. We don't know yet, but we will let you know when the results arrive. It may have played a role. I see. And you just found him there, lying in the cold. She withdraws, trying to picture the scene. How long had he been there? If you say two days, maybe, it will be etched in her mind forever. It's hard to say at this point. Couldn't have been that long. She blinks, eyes welling up with tears, as her hand starts searching for something from the pockets of her dress. The handkerchief. Aww. Don't give her the lieutenant's handkerchief. It's too special. I want to keep it, but she needs it more than me, you know? Here, take this. Give her the lieutenant's handkerchief. No words, just give her the lieutenant's handkerchief. Take this. Yes, thank you. She smiles a small, terrified smile, then wipes away her tears. She looks disoriented. Is there anyone we could call for you? A friend, a family member, someone who could be here for you? No, no. 
I just need to tell my girls. The air gets sucked out of her lungs suddenly. It burns like acid. God, should I call them? Should I tell them to come home? No. A day. Yes, they should know. Do you want us to call them and ask them here? No, take a day to recover. You'll be better prepared when they come home tomorrow. Good. That's probably the right thing. Thank you. She nods, but with a wretched expression. Just tell me, what do I need to do next? Where is he? Can I see him? We've taken him to the city morgue. The local coroner will be contacting you shortly to arrange the funeral. Here's his number in case you want to contact him earlier. He hands her a leaflet with the morgue's contact information. A very good call. Is there anything else that the RCM could do for you? No, I'll call you if something comes up. I'm still... She rubs her face, runs her fingers over cheeks that have become numb. Thank you. Thank you for telling me. I'll call if... She looks down. She runs out of breath. These are her last reserves of strength. Her muscles will give in soon. Already, she starts to shake. Again, I'm very sorry, ma'am. We should step outside and talk. Set the library card by her. Leave the room. The lieutenant nods at the woman, then looks back at you, his voice lowered. I didn't get to look at everything in their house. <laughs> I'm bummed that I missed that stuff, but... And I also wanted to keep his handkerchief, but... I'm, she needs it more than me, you know? It's really cool how stuff like that, little things that you get, come into play later. Everything feels like it has a purpose. You know. Hi. You did well. The lieutenant says as soon as you left the apartment, the balcony feels cool and quiet with a stunning view over the district. Nod, what now? I could have done more. You did enough. He pauses, running, rubbing his hands together to generate some heat. Can't save the whole world, you know. Can't bring the dead back. What now? I'll call the station when we're finished with the day, and let them know the name of the deceased. That's it? What about Billy and her kids? They'll manage. They have to. It's not your place to live their lives. And that's it? That's it. We should get back to our case now that our duty here is done. Alright, this is close then. Let's go. <sighs> Shit, man. <laughs> it's really sad. I, like, teared up. It's just really hard. Let's go... to... reset the traps. Why don't we do that? Why don't we do something happy? <laughs> Maybe even look into that. Okay, I know I should finish this episode right now, but man, screw that. I'm playing for more. need to remember where the traps were. <laughs> Let's see. I have to say, I am really lucky this episode. I know I'm gonna jinx it, but I've been passing a lot of the checks that I've done. So it's very surprising. I'm just very relieved. Because <laughs> a lot of them that I've had to do were red checks, and that's always so stressful. Alright. The locusts aren't doing all too well, but they're still in there. This isn't the empty trap. That must have been another one. I know where it is. I know where. I just had to go all the way over here. Um, okay, I only have a little bit left in my storage, my camera, to record, so I can't play for much longer, but see if she has anything to say. What is it? The woman is still hunched over the keyboard, gently illuminated by the party machine. I didn't break anything, did I? Hey, are you the lead programmer of the world? We're all untethered by any chance? Sorry, but who are you? What are you doing here? I didn't break anything, did I? No, you just printed out my personal lock and wasted some paper. 
It does not look like a big loss to her. Are you the lead programmer? Yes. Or, no. Not anymore. That project is dead. She thinks to herself. She doesn't seem surprised to be recognized. Rather sad. Something passes over her face before she straightens her back. Sorry, but who are you? What are you doing here? I am Sona Luukkanen Kilde, the former lead oh. <laughs> programmer of Fortress Accident and RSA radios. I have over 16 years of programming experience, and I'm proficient in both Vox and Orbis languages. If you're not here to hire me, I don't really know how I can help you. She turns back to the terminal. Uh, I'm looking to start a nightclub. <laughs> have you seen the crab man? Why are there so many place machines in this place? What are you doing in an abandoned church? How do you feel about anodic dance music? Have you seen the crab man? No. But you know he's around? Yes. He's seen you. He must have seen you. It sounds like you're not worried about him at all. He's seen you. And? And the crab man has seen you. I don't care. I don't care about crab men. She barely looks up, now tinkering with the machine's printer. Wow. She really doesn't. Not afraid, this one. Why are there so many machines in this place? I brought them here. These are my machines. Please don't touch anything. Why do you need an antenna? Point to it. What are you doing with these radio computers? What about those bowls of water over there? Why do you need an antenna? I use the AR-1 as my RAIN Prefect's processing unit. Wait, what? RAIN Prefect. My radio computer. And that antenna is its processing unit? Yes. You really don't know anything about radio computers, do you? She stops. She has stopped working now. I know a little. <laughs> all right. Well, all radio computers perform operations up on air. So in order to gain more processing power, you need to invest in a good antenna. Uh, and the AR-1, is it, is it a good antenna? I guess it is. So far, I've been quite satisfied with it. Martinez is an unstable region with bad coverage, and the operation has been surprisingly stable. Hmm. But it's not the cheapest one on the market, so I wouldn't recommend it for your regular red tape operations. Fraser 1000 is a foolproof line for civilians. Anyway, you should do some research before you decide to buy anything. Ask around, compare the prices. There are many milieus dedicated to that sort of thing. She liked to tell me this. It calmed her nerves. Ah. Uh, what about those bowls of water over there? They are connected to my rain prefect. Whatever you do, just please don't move them, okay? Thanks. Short and terse. There you have it. Whatever she's using them for, they're hers. What are you doing with your radio computer? I'm working. The machine seems almost alien with its pulsing core. The light casts in her face in a strange shadow. Working on what? Could you... Could you just... <laughs> for a moment? Or get to the point. I really need to focus on something. She closes her eyes. It's not just rudeness. It really is hard to concentrate on whatever she needs to do. And you're not helping. Alright, I'll try not to touch anything. Great. Uh, how do you feel about anodic dance music? What? I hate it. She squints her eyes. I bet she hasn't even heard it. Have you even listened to it? Like, actually listened? What are you, 40? It's the future of dance music. Same here. It just doesn't connect. Here. Not like disco does, anyway. Oh, wow. That was quick. Why do you hate it? Have you even listened to it? Yeah. Like, all the time. <laughs> My tent neighbors don't really ease up with their partying, do they? She pulls a face that looks absolutely scathing. Maybe I'd have to be on drugs to get it, but to a sober mind it just sounds like uninspired rock whipping. No idea what it has to do with either dancing or music. Okay. Here's what I think is going to happen. She's not going to let them into this area because this is the area where she has set up all her items and stuff. So it's not like she can just move out willingly, right? So I feel like she's going to have to move back into the Doom commercial area. But Playsons doesn't want her to, so we'll probably have to convince Playsons to let her in. That's my... That's my guess. <laughs> right, right. But how do you feel about Club... A club for anodic dance music. This is about those speed freaks in the tent, isn't it? I've got some news for you. It's not a nightclub they want to build here. What do they want to build, then? Take a guess, why don't you? 
<laughs> um, a youth center would be nice. A petting zoo, a place for animals. Maybe some community space to help the elderly. I'm so convinced I want to establish a nightclub for Enotic dance music. They said it's their dream. I can't believe they got you so easily. Go have another talk with those up and coming entrepreneurs, will you? Thanks. The lead programmer sighs. Good luck. I'm not coming in there. <laughs> All right. Bye. I need to wrap up this episode really bad because it's gone on forever. Holy shit. But, uh, I want to keep going with this side quest. Let's just talk to them real quick. It's fine. And also, Kim can absolutely fit in that tent. I don't know what he's talking about. He's like, I'm too old to go in there. Kim's not even that old. Is he? I don't- I honestly don't know. He hasn't said his age. He says Harry's, like, older. He refers to him as older. And Harry's like, mm, 50s? Early 50s? Mid 50s? I don't know. Kim is probably like, mid 30s. Talk to Andre. Andre! I like Andre. I think he actually wants to start the nightclub, you know? There's some- someone's home away from home, like yours. Yes. Alright. Sorry, Kim. Can't wait to start a nightclub. <laughs> Speaker, the big kind they use for live music. Uh, alright. Can we talk to Noid? So you had a talk with Andre, and now you want to discuss things with Noid. Good. Skin shows who is hol the holes in his- Speed Freak's too large sweater in front of him and open to a box full of carpentry tools and parts. It's good you talked to Andre first. Gave me time to get a reading on your sign. Can't really talk to people before you get a reading. He runs his hand through his hair, which is combed back in mock seriousness and continues to fiddle with some gears. Sign? I saw a sticker on the padlock. Can you tell me anything about it? Tell me about the machines you saw in the church. Why are you called Noid? Okay, maybe I can't- I don't think I'm gonna talk to him just because I'm running out of time. I see the stickers on there. Actually, everywhere now that I look at it. Hi again. So, uh, how things going? Hmm. Let's try to up my logic. Do that, and... Let's see. My outfit is insane. I'm trying to up my logic as much as I can. I think I'm still gonna fail it though. Oh shit. Oh yeah, that's a meteor and name. If you don't know what the fell. Okay. Come to think of it. I got something else. Yes. Let's try it. The number of things don't add up. Let's take a look. I just had to dress in a ridiculous outfit. <laughs> How about gather around, kids? Okay, kids, now gather around. The young speed freak puts down a busted capacitor and looks at you. The one with the large head seems very enthusiastic about whatever you have planned. Their would-be leader is less amused. Hmm. Sometime in the past, I'm not sure when and where, but betrayal was involved. I fell sick and become the shadow you see now, but before that, I have reason to believe I was a police detective. <laughs> I don't know what my play is here, but let's try it. But you still are! Thank you for your kind words, but everyone in here sees I'm a disgrace to the uniform. I was good enough in this job to be awarded the rank of Lieutenant Euphrater. I could have been captain. Imagine that. What happened? <laughs> Egghead looks serious suddenly. Disco happened. It smelled so impossibly sweet. Life tore me a new asshole. I did. I happened myself. What am I talking about? I don't know what my goal is here. Disco happened. I've been trying to say we need the next step in dance music to happen fast. Shut it. He looks at his friend. What? I have. I've said that. Now, obviously, that might have might as well have been a thousand years ago, but there's still some detective left in me. The young speed freak is silent. He senses something is wrong. Soon I hinted that there's something else going on, that I'm being naive. You're sober. Was it hard for you to keep sober in the, for this meeting? This isn't the makings of a club, it's a tent full of labor laboratory laboratory equipment for manufacturing drugs. They seem like they're on drugs. <laughs> I 
I have no idea how you arrived at that conclusion, but it's wrong. Look, we even have speakers. He points at the speakers. One speaker. They have one speaker. Where's his friend? Did he lose his friend? We have no headphones. Wouldn't a cell need her headphones to spin tape? The ether and the air, a useful solvent. Good for acting, getting acting agent out of a solution. We have no headphones. What do you know about spinning tape? Nothing. Where's his friend? Did he lose his friend? What do you mean friend? The other speaker, you only have one. It's a one speaker system. It's monodynamic. You wouldn't know the first thing about sound reproduction in a nodded music. Other speaker. The ether in the air, a useful solvent. Good for getting acting agent out of a solution. Make up your mind. First it's the sweat, then it's the ether. He smiles nervously. There's no need for me to pile any on any more, is there? No shit. He sounds tired. Suna hinted that there's something else going on, that I'm being naive. Hey man, who knows what she's on about? I get it. She doesn't want us in the church. She's got something against us. She scoff- or he scoffs. Who doesn't like to dance? She doesn't like to dance. You're sober. Was it hard for you to keep sober in this meeting? We don't need drugs to be hardcore. Shut the fuck up, Egg. <laughs> Maybe not today, Egg. But you need drugs to get through the days when you're not expecting me. Climb down from the equestrian monument, cop man. Consciousness is new to the universe. We all have our ways to ease the shock. Bottom line is, I know. What exactly is it you know? In short, you tried to use a police detective to set up a drug lab. That's... come on, that's... Preposterous, against the law, punishable by summary execution. <laughs> against the law? I meant to say, not true. So what are we going to do with you? What do you mean, do? There's resignation in his voice. He's almost ready to drop the act. It wouldn't take a lot of pushing. But I wanted a disco rave scene. The optimal way to go about this would be indifference. It begins by you telling him you don't care about any of this. We do this lawman style. First you tell me everything, then I pass judgment. You tell me what's really going on and we'll work from there. I can be lenient. Um, I don't really care. I just wanted wanted to crack the case. Do what you want and I'll do what I want. Uh, I can be lenient. What do you mean by lenient? Not calling back up and hauling you all, all off to the pen for starters. Haven't you heard? I'm the dirtiest cop on the side of the river. I'll make life hard for you, using every connection I've got. We'll see. Now speak. Not calling out back up for starters. Okay, man. Okay. He raises his ha hands. Things are just so, so hard for an entrepreneur in this city right now. It's not like we lied when we said we want to turn a church into the wickedest club in East Revershall. You just left a few parts out, right? Because we do! We totally do! We just need to turn it into a speed lab before. Come on, Andre. To get our foot in the door. And why did you need me? Like I told you, spooky arseholes moved in while I was getting all this stuff together. A month ago, the place was empty, and now it's all spooked up. They're not really spooky, are they? No, man. They're spooky, all right. It's just that they would also probably call the police if we started cooking speed in there. Yeah, I wonder why. But the sign was way off, too. I couldn't feel the love at all. Sir, you promised you'd be lenient. This is it. Judgment time. <laughs> Give me your cash, ask for bribe first. Pack up and report to Precinct 41, arrest them. Get lost, I don't want to see you again, evict them. Let's do this clean, no speed lab, just a club for anodic music. It wouldn't work without the lab, do what you have to do to keep the club alive. No speed lab, just a club. Yeah! The young man's smile winds to inhuman proportions, his teeth beam into the floodlight. I knew it! <laughs> the would-be leader drops his spiked head between his knees. It's impossible now. It's not. No, Andre, it's harder now. This hard cop has come to show us how much the fish is, and the fish is always so much more. We all know there was never going to be a club for anodic music with the speed lab. Now it has a fighting chance. So there was never going to be a club in there? There needs to be a club for anodic music in there. Needs to. Everyone hates each other. 
Everybody hates it here. It's all just drugs and we're slaves and I can't. <laughs> we are running out of time. What? We need a win, Andre. I promise this will be a win. We won't cook speed in there. We'll do it clean. We'll do it true. We'll do it sober and real and beautiful. This will be a victory for the light. You got that right, Egghead. Okay. We'll try to do it without the drugs. He raises his head between his knees. We'll do a straight club up in there, spinning the maddest wheels, and nothing but, I swear to God. Okay, Egg? Yeah. From here on, it'll be straight all the way. All right, about the church, I checked it out. And? I talked to what the, happened? I talked to the crab man. Oh, man. Who is he? What did you think? Seems okay, to be honest. Very spiritual. You give me this old lecture about on alcoholism before rambling on about mother's love. But right, he's a true nar narcomaniac, and the way he climbs, it was terrifying. Uh, so, give me an odd lecture. Really? Huh. Interesting. What's he doing in the church? Uh, just preaching and praying from the looks of it. No matter. Is he gonna be a problem? The paranoid young man mumbles gruffly. Yeah, Noid is right. Let's get back to the point. What are we gonna do about him? These guys will never catch him. You will never catch him. There's nothing to do. Um... As far as I can tell, he's not going to leave. He'll cr climb around up there and guys, you'll never catch him. Actually, he told me he wouldn't mind the nightclub at all. I don't know, man. Doesn't it feel like a major hindrance to you? A spooky guy climbing around when all the guests are trying to have nice friendly hyper time? He rubs his jaw. Don't worry, I don't think he really gives a damn about you or anyone else. I guess it's not a massive problem, now that I think of it. Yeah. Okay, I had to delete some stuff off my camera to, so I could keep recording. <laughs> it's gonna be like a three hour long episode. Oh my god. Okay. Everyone is welcome! To dance till the morning light! Yeah! I can't wait. Maybe. Uh, I guess we'll figure something out. Okay, but what about the other spooker? The one in Grandma's clothes? Did you see her? I was using the mainframe when Suna, the former leader of program- Lead programmer of Fortress Accident appeared. A programmer? That's odd. What was she like? Did you ask her about the nightclub? She did not like the Anodic Dance Club idea. What a pity. That's my favorite thing in the world, and she doesn't like it at all. He drops the hammer back into the toolbox. A shame. What can we do now? Do you see a way out of this jam <laughs> and into a laser lit future of dance and unity? I hope so. Unity! Dance! She made it very clear that she won't leave until her own project is finished. And you can't just evict her? No, I won't evict her. We have to come up with a different solution. Look at you, honor man. No, Noid. He's right. Maybe we've approached it the wrong way after all. I'm sure there's a workaround. We can make a deal not to bother her. If that's okay with her, we only want to get in the church and spread the joy and ecstasy of music. <laughs> the lines in the dark exist. Coexist. At least Crabman seems like an advanced being. He's odd. He'll understand. <laughs> Yeah, he can do his climbing thing in the tower. And the programmer, does she like anodic dance music? She absolutely does not. Really, truly despises it. Egghead cannot believe what <laughs> she just said. It makes him pump the jam a little slower for a moment. But then he returns to the full swing of it. Aw, sorry, Egghead. No worries. We'll figure it out. If coexisting fails, you can always muscle her out, right? If it's all okay with you, what do you think? I refuse to throw her out, but I can try convincing her. Excellent! Good luck, my friend! He smiles wide like a replica of his friend with the large head. Goodbye, officer. Alright. <laughs> so they're all, like, druggies, but, you know, at least we get the nightclub. Like I said, I feel like we're gonna have to convince Plaisance to let her move back into the old place. Like, that's gonna... Probably gonna be what's gonna happen. All right, let's change out of this outfit, please. Pain with pastel. Someone's trying to bring cheer into the world. Let's talk to her, and then 
If it seems like it's gonna go on for a lot longer, I'll just end the episode here, but I really wanna keep playing. You guys don't know how hard it is to turn this game off. Okay, hi, do you wanna... <laughs> Would you like a rave scene in here, please? Oh, hi, Kim. We're... <laughs> yes, what is it? Uh, can it... Hold on. <laughs> Kim, how about you move over here? All right. Yes, there. what is it? Uh, okay. Uh, what if you didn't have to leave? I talked to Andre. He wants to make it work. I don't want to make anything work. Her expression remains unchanged. Hold on. You don't want to make anything work? Yes, anything. I don't want to make anything work. It's not the anodic dance music that's made her bitter. Yep. It's the failure of Fortress Accident. Are you bitter because your radio game project failed? That's right. If we couldn't get our Welkins to happen, I don't want anything to happen. Ever again. There's not a trace of irony in her voice. She means it. Let's try it. Easy. <laughs> when her research is done, she can move out. Okay, so we don't have to convince her to leave to uh, the other place. Listen, about your research, maybe I can help with anything? Help you refill those water basins or something? What? No, I don't really need any help with the project. But if I could help you finish the project, then you wouldn't have to live in a church next to Boom Boom anymore. Just think about it. She thinks about it. A glassy look in her eyes. A gust of wind brings more snow in from the broken gallery. It touches her hair. All right. Bring me the game's offside copy from my old workspace, if you really want to help. I have it! It's stored on a filament memory, and I'm unable to go and fetch it myself. Um, okay. Is this the filament you're looking for? No. That's the production schedule Wait, you stole and accessed without authorization. I don't need it. She's tapping the table in badly concealed impatience. In his defense, it was simply laying in the desk drawer of an abandoned cubicle. Thank you, Kim. Okay, but still. What is an offsite copy and why do you need it? It's a backup of my former employer's project, the radio game we were working on. It's stored on a filament memory, just like the one inside this radio computer. She points to the glowing cube inside the machine. She's making it extra simple for you. <laughs> the backup itself is destroyed now, but I'm hoping to use what's left of it to pinpoint the exact location of the anomaly. You just have to go to my old workspace and get the filament. Hold on. If it's called an off-site copy, then why is it still <laughs> on site? If it's called an off-site copy, then why is it still on site? Oh god, not this again. <sighs> it is not on site. It is in the basement. Perfectly safe and not connected to the front at all. Basement? Sounds like <laughs> it's technically still on site. And no, taking it outside the building wouldn't have protected it from the data loss. There's nothing wrong with keeping the backup in the basement. What happened was a freak accident that has nothing to do with how the backup was stored. Huh. We clear? She stares at you with pleading furious eyes. This is clearly a painful topic for her. She must have had to explain herself numerous times. By your old workspace, do you mean the studio of Fortress Accident in the Doom commercial area? Yeah, that's the one. You can get in through the bookshop. You just have to do some explaining to the bookstore lady. Um, actually, I've already been inside the Dune commercial area. Good. Then you might know the giant ice bear fridge in the building's cellar. Wait, what? The filament is inside the fridge. Just go and get it. And where exactly is the offsite copy? In the giant oh. ice bear fridge. I just told you. <laughs> it has red glowing eyes. It's impossible to miss. You just need to get the offside copy from the ice box. <laughs> but you've been to the fridge and it wasn't there. There was a note saying. Yeah, I feel like we would have seen it. I found a note from the ice bear fridge. It said the offsite copy has been moved to a safer place. Wait, a note from whom? She freezes. Did it specify where they took the filament memory? It said the offsite copy had been taken to a nearby ice cream maker. The note was signed by someone named Sulesua. Zawisa, of course. Our project lead, Suliswov Zaviza. 
God, he was always so hell bent on keeping the copy somewhere safe. <laughs> that feature creep and the valley of the head. She mutters. Like it would have made a difference. The offside copy was perfectly safe when the data loss happened. That data loss was anomalous. So did they lose all the progress that they made on their game? And the heads. I won't even get into the heads. Millions of them. Go find that copy from that ice cream maker, will you? Thanks. Valley of a thousand heads. You like the sound of that. By the way, we put a dead body in the fridge. No, I'm not telling her that Kim is gonna kill me. Thanks. Alright. She thinks for a moment, then reaches behind the radio computer and hands what hands you what looks like an oversized pry bar. And here's oh. Mike Falsund's multi-tool. You might need it to hack loose some ice. It opens everything. If you get me the offside copy, then you can keep the Falsund. Nice. It hurts a bit for her to say this. Oh. She's not too happy to be parting with the Kvalsund. Alright. Let's go find that thing. <laughs> God, this episode is gonna be so long. I'm so sorry. Now we have a cool pry bar. Oh, damn. Whoa. This is an advanced pry bar. A pry bar plus two, if you will, built by Svalsson in Vasa. The number of gadgets hidden within the frame of the yellow and gray multi-tool will stagger any technician. Pretty cool, huh, Kim? I wonder what else it can open. <gasps> Oh, the freaking container, the thingy, in the freaking thing, <laughs> in the harbor, I mean, you know? Shit, dude. I'm so hyped. All right, I guess we're going to go searching for all the... This orange oh, wow. machine is buzzing like an old submarine. It has a hand-cranked ice cream churner on top and an electric freezer that appears to be frozen shut. Okay, wait, what if we unplug all of them? Two uh, cables are plugged into the brick and that. electric sizzle. The room is slightly quieter now. Plug the black cable. Something close to you. Very smart. Opening the lid should be much easier after the ice cream maker has defrosted. Thank you. Let's try it. This orange machine is dead still. It has Turn the a crank. hand. Turning the crank feels oddly satisfying, like stirring your childhood dreams. In the distance, you hear water. Dripping. It's all gone now. You'll never become a poet or an entrepreneur. Hold on. Is there anything I can do to increase my physical strength? I kind of am annoyed that I have to. that I don't have, you know, like the chance to just open it, you know? Is it. It's a physical instrument, right? Let's try it. This orange machine is dead. Ice squeaks <sighs> beneath your Kvalsu multi-tool. But your fingers slip away from the tool. The lid shut as tightly as before. And it's already <sighs> unplugged. There's not much else to do other than wait for it to defrost or bulk up and get stronger. Let's try... There's more around here, so... Oh, wait. Was that the only one I could try? Shit. All right. Mm. I'm sad. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna leave this episode off here. We did a lot this episode. Holy crap. This episode has been so long. I just almost wanted to make up for the last part because I felt so bad about it. Um, not gonna lie. Uh... I didn't like the last episode because I just, I was off my game, I was in so much pain, blah blah blah, we already know that. So this episode has been extra long, and I've really enjoyed playing it. I just have so much fun with this game all the time, and I want to know what's going on with the plot so bad. Um, because everything feels like it's piecing together so well, like, every tiny little interaction that you have comes into play later, like, just getting Kim's handkerchief in the beginning and giving it to the lady um, when she lost her husband. It's just so, it's so good. It feels so intentional, like everything that the writers put in there means something, and I just love that in games. I wasted like all of my money on that board game that I didn't even really use. I'm gonna keep that if I wanna pass time, and uh, yeah, I, I wanna play that board game with Kim again really bad, cause that was fun. 
It was really funny. I wasn't expecting it to be like, don't fuck with me. Like, literally say that. It was amazing. We also spoke to those two dudes. We got their jackets. I passed a lot of checks this episode, and I was very surprised. Um, I feel like I... It was probably good I, I failed that last one because I needed to end this episode here. We'll figure out soon uh, how to get that open and then hopefully get a rave close started. <laughs> it's amazing. This game is amazing. Um, of course, those dudes are on drugs. I mean, it, I really like Andre still, but it it's pretty obvious that he's under the influence. <laughs> Hope you guys are enjoying this series so far. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a like or subscribe if you're new because I'd love to have you stick around and watch me play some video games and hang out with me. I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.